this week's episode of Creepscast is sponsored by Audible. Visit audible.com slash survive and listen now to Impact Winner Audible and Green Chef. Go to greenchef.com slash mrcreep130 and use code mrcreep130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Hello everyone, I hope you've all been doing well. I'm really excited for the increase in viewership as recent on the podcast, and I just wanted to say hello to all you new listeners out there, and of course, for those who have been around for a while now, thank you all for the support on the podcast. Let's not waste any more time, as we drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. A lot of you people aren't following the rules. Are we doing something wrong? Written by Zithero. Hello everyone. I'm sure you're all very aware of my previous work. Well, okay, not my previous work exclusively. The work of my team and those like them, that is. Let me explain. Whenever we come across a cryptoid infested area, be it spiritual, unruly animals, or just plain old unexplainable phenomena, my team comes in and jots down a handy list of rules for everyone to follow to avoid a certain demise. Now, why there is such a large number of folks who don't seem capable of following those rules is beyond me. So, so many missing campers. But that's why we're having this quality assurance session. Us. We're the folks who go in and figure out what the rules are, and man oh man, let me tell you, it ain't easy. So I'm jotting this down at the moment to describe to everyone later. Explain the happenings and hope that our latest set of rules will in fact be more helpful. Because five minutes on this subreddit has really shown you guys how terrible at following written instructions. Rules especially. Bunch of rebels. Which is weird. So clearly it's either an issue with the rules that we're jotting down or it's you folks. So, help us out in finding the common denominator, will you? Okay, let's get going. So first, I'm going to introduce the team. We are the Occult Observation Catalogers, OOC for short. The team is composed of a number of our disposable interns. First off, we have John Z. He's a college student of Indian descent. Has dark black hair, surprisingly green eyes, and is about five foot six, I guess. Roughly, anyway. And he's here to get some field experience. Let's see how long that works out. We've got Rebecca. Who really needs a job and we've told her that? Just a few more trips out will get her all set up with something more long term. Honestly, I have yet to clear that with the board. But she's made it to three weeks and that's a new record for field work. Rebecca's a redhead who's not hard in the eyes and has a brown eyes herself. She thinks that I can't see through the blue context, but I can. She's a little shorter than John Z, I think. Girl is always wearing platform shoes and a skirt. Leggings with it, of course. Guess that's the style these days. She's not indecent or anything. Guess she just likes to look nice on the job. Oh, and lastly, we have Dieter. Dieter's from Sweden or Finland, honestly I can't remember which one. Blonde hair, blue eyes, real tall, Scandinavian fella. Nice kid, but man oh man, he's got a stack of bricks where his brain ought to be. He's got passable English for the most part, but he's mostly here for the muscle. That boy's almost seven feet freaking tall. Real Viking if you ask me. Anyway, today's goal... Visit a haunted house and determine what pisses off the specter and what appeases said specter. Then we'll jot down the rules for this house and leave them in the mailbox or with the owner. So that the next time one of you folks comes for an overnight stay, you might actually survive the night. If you follow the rules. So, first things first. We had to start off with the outside. And Dieter walked around with me knocking on various parts of the house, rattling windows and checking the foundation for cracks or major signs of wear and tear. 
I'm also checking for non-supernatural things. Termite damage, water seepage, maybe some unwanted erosion or chipping on the siding. And Dieter stopped, frozen for a moment. I sighed. First hit, okay. Oh, what's happening, Dieter? Um, Dieter looked at his hands and uh, they were twitching and shaking sporadically. I, uh, I think I touched that window, he said, pointing to the only window with a light on. Well, I saw you touch the window there, bud. Mind giving it another knock. I figured that he was already screwed. I mean, how much worse could it get? Dieter went to the window and knocked again. I nearly dumped a load of my pants as the light shut off, and a horrific specter's face smashed against the glass. Dieter screamed and scrambled away from the window as I watched the face of what appeared to be a drowned woman pressed harder and harder against the glass. Her nose broke, as did her skin and black blood poured out of her wounds, covering the entire window in blackness before fading away. The lights flicked on again. Rule number one, I said, writing this down on my notepad despite my shaking hands. Do not knock on the window if the light is on. I checked my watch. After, well, it's 2am, but let's just go with after midnight. That's usually when this gets all squirrely. I turned on my heel. You alive, Dieter? Dieter cleared his throat. Uh, yes, yes, I'm alive. Oh, fantastic. Come on, we've got more things to check out. I turned to him. Oh, and no knocking on the windows with the lights on, okay? I've only got one set of underwear on me and I nearly ruined it. I turned, heading off towards the backyard. Not going commando today. Dieter nodded, trembling, and started following me. I heard twigs snapping and then heard Dieter walking past me. Dieter, what are you doing, buddy? I asked. His eyes were wide as he started moving towards the tree line. Uh, I see lights. Well, what kind of lights, buddy? I asked, having a good idea of where he was going. Yellow lights, look, don't you see them? Dieter asked. I didn't see any lights as he made his way to the tree line. After he passed me into the darkness of the woods, I heard him screaming. I sighed. Rule number two, do not enter the woods at night, especially if you see the yellow lights. I paused. Mom, best to just say lights. Pretty sure the color doesn't matter. And Dieter rushed out of the tree line, scrapes and bruises all over his face and body as he ran towards me. It's after me. I sighed. Well, I can see that, Dieter. Dieter turned and screamed in horror as tendrils of shadow whipped out of the tree line and wrapped around his body. I flinched as I spotted the tendrils that pierced his skin with thorns and spikes before dragging him back into the woods. I underlined rule number two. Very important. I said as I headed inside the house. Hey Dieter, if you survive, I'll be inside. An inhuman roar echoed from the woods and I decided it was best to leave whatever it was alone. Dieter was a big fella, I'm sure that he'd be fine. Surely better off than I would be. So to avoid becoming the woods' next victim, I hurried inside. I'm not going to claim that I have nerves of steel, but I sure as heck know when to run. Great advice from Kenny Rogers. If not, there's always more interns. Speaking of the other interns, I walked inside to find Yanzi clawing at his legs which were sunk into the floor. Well crap, what happened? I asked, doing my best to act concerned for his well-being. I poked the edge of the wooden floorboards with my pen, noting that his jeans in the floorboards didn't even have a seam, like something had welded him to the ground. I, I was walking around and I found a loose board, so I kicked it to see if there was anything there, and then the floor started to eat me. He sunk further into the floorboards, which I noticed were turning a deeper hue of red, and they appeared newer now. The fresh wood spread outwards from his body. Well, that's a shame, I sighed. Okay, so rule number three. Do not damage or move any part of the house, even if it appears to be broken. Help me! Anzi cried out as he sank to his waist. Oh, God! The flooring was looking brand new now, and I cringed, 
looking around to ensure that I wasn't going to be next. Well, uh, I don't think there's much that I can do, I said, stepping away from the new floor as it creeped outwards from his body at an alarmingly rapid rate. I stepped into the kitchen area, where it seemed the floor changed from hardwood to tile. I shuddered as his screams grew more panicked as the floor sucked him in more and more. My stomach was uneasy. As many times as I lost interns on these projects, it was usually a situation of rounding a corner to find one of them, just dead or finding them turned into a statue. You know, the normal stuff. Still, it's hard to get over, but that's what I'm used to. One girl didn't follow a rule and wound up locked inside her house while a velociraptor ran around outside and it ate the neighbor's dog. And you want to know the crazy part? The dang thing was a chicken during the day, though we left pretty clear feeding instructions too. But I digress. This was much worse than I had seen before. Help me, please. He shouted as he clawed fruitlessly at the floorboards, now at chest height. His nails broke on the hardwood, but the more damage he did, the faster he sank. Finally, when Hansi reached out and tried to pull himself out, his arms didn't come up. His arms were now being devoured by the living room floor, which was looking very nice and updated now. It seemed it was even making the walls look like they had a fresh coat of paint. No, Jazzy screamed as his head was tilted back. No. I shivered as his screams grew garbled and the house shook. It appeared his face was melting across the floor until finally I watched his green eyes turn brown and become nothing more than a pattern of knots on the new hardwood. Rebecca came running down the steps as quickly as her platform shoes allowed, her eyes wide in shock. Was Jazzy just screaming? She walked onto the new flooring, nothing happening to her. I sighed in relief, looking to rule number three. Let's see. Ah, okay, got it. I started rewriting rule number three. Do not try to move or fix anything broken or you'll be used to fix what you break. I smiled. Looks nice and ominous, but not off-putting. Perfect. Is he gone? Rebecca asked. Sorry, Rebecca, that's the sitch, I sighed. Poor guy got eaten by the house and turned into some mahogany flooring. I knelt by the floor and gave it a knock. Wow, that's some high-quality stuff. Rebecca narrowed her eyes on me. Really? What? The kid makes good hardwood, apparently. I said, standing up. That's not like I did it to him. Nothing I could have done. He was way steep in the floorboards by the time that I found him. Shouldn't we have some kind of protection from this kind of stuff? Rebecca asked, or are we just disposable? Protection like what? Half the time we don't even know what we're walking into, I shrugged. And besides, you're unpaid interns. It's either this or sitting in a cubicle all day. Rebecca rubbed the bridge of her nose. Please, just tell me this is my last field job. I can tell you that if you make it out of this one alive with a fresh set of rules, you're hired. I fibbed. I mean, it wasn't a lie exactly. I just wasn't certain. I could bring up my suggestion to the big bosses and all but whether or not they would be up for a new hire was beyond my pay grade. I just observed. We heard a scratching and howling from the back door. Help! Let me in, please! And Dieter's voice called out. Rebecca sighed. What did you do to Dieter? Again, not me, it's the house, I pointed out. Observation is our middle name, remember? Rebecca sighed and leaned out the back window. Hey, Dieter, you there? I moved to the other window to see that, yes, Dieter was there. His shirt was ripped, as was one pant leg, and Dieter was also missing his shoe. He was covered in blood, both red and black. Leaves and dirt were all over him. Leading from the forest, however, I could see that he had some kind of tendril attached between his shoulder blades. Yes, Rebecca, it's Dieter, please let me in, yes, Dieter asked. I looked at Rebecca and shook my head. Rebecca sighed. Oh, sorry, Dieter. She went back in and closed the window. I closed my window just as Dieter appeared before the window, smashing his hands against the glass. Please, there's a voice in my head. 
It says terrible things that I need to do, Dieter shouted, hammering on the glass but not breaking it. What happened to him? Rebecca asked. My eldritch horror or something got him. I said jotting down on my notepad. Rule number four. Do not let anyone in, even if you think you know them. Rebecca heaved a sigh. Maybe make a note about them being unable to harm you, Rebecca pointed out. And Dieter could have broken that glass if he really wanted to. I smiled. Nice observation, Rebecca. I jotted down the information. They will not be able to break in, as long as you don't invite them. Rebecca looked over at the notepad. Everything else seemed okay upstairs. Oh wait, there's some banging in the closet, so don't open that. Rule number five. Do not open the closet, no matter what you hear. I smiled. Nice, that's three for me and two for you. Honestly, I think that works in your favor for the feathers at the office. Mm-hmm. Rebecca said sarcastically. So, should we get going? Uh, yeah. I waved to Dieter. Sorry, buddy. Better luck next time. I trailed off. Oh, dang. I guess there won't be a next time. Dang you. An inhuman voice shrieked as Dieter's body was ripped back. I felt a shiver and an uneasiness fill my chest. As I watched his once blue eyes become overcome with a black pitch. It was as if he had stared into a void and it had stared back into my soul. Rebecca snatched my notepad from me, ripping me out of my stupor. Rule number six. Do not look into their eyes. I shivered. Well said, Rebecca. Let's get out of here. I'm excited and my final bit of field work. Rebecca announced as we headed out of the building. So... If you ever find yourself on 318 Dogwood Avenue in Eclat, Ohio, remember the following rules. 1. Do not knock on the window if the light is on after 12 a.m. 2. Very important. Do not enter the woods at night, especially if you see lights. 3. Do not damage anything or try to move or fix anything broken. You'll be used to fix what is broken. 4. Do not invite anyone in, even if you think that you know them. They won't be able to break in, as long as you don't invite them. 5. Do not open the closets, no matter what you hear. 6. Do not look into their eyes. So, using you folk as our QA team, how'd we do? Thank you to today's Creepscast sponsor, Audible. Listen to the new Audible original, Impact Winner, from executive producers of The Walking Dead and the writer of Pacific Rim. A totally original new saga created just for Audible. Presented in immersive 3D audio that dares you to pop in your earbuds and listen in the dark. In the near future, a comet hits the earth and blots out the sun. Beastly creatures emerge in the sunless world, and they might just be vampires. Follow the story of two sisters. Darcy, who is a battle-tested vampire hunter trying to save the world. And Hope, who is desperate for life to be normal again. And we cannot relate. Hear how a brave few fight to survive the impact winter and fight to live again. Visit audible.com slash survive. And listen now to Impact Winter. The military posted us on a nondescript classified island. I don't think we're alone. Written by Dival59. I had woken up early once again. I tottered downstairs, holding tight to my dressing gown and curling my toes up with each step so as to not let my slippers well um, slip off. They had a tendency to do that. I could feel the morning chill hanging heavy in the house, as if it had as much right to be there as I did. Perhaps more. It had lived here longer than we had after all. The windows had grown a coat of icy condensation, but it failed to hide the lands of and the shadow behind them. Muted both in aesthetic and sound, I always thought that was odd. 
the background noise and artificial light that most people are accustomed to, to a point where they're not even noticed, like the tip of your nose peeking in your vision, or absent here. And the sheer lack of well either was ironically deafening and blinding. I missed them a lot. At this time of morning, the house may have been situated in the center of space, or some vast, endless void. There was nothing but inky blackness that pressed in around us in every direction, as if we were a foothold. A mere redoubt of life and vibrancy that it, at all costs, must snuff out. I made my way to the kitchen, muttering a prayer beneath my breath which was answered when I had switched on the light, and the old room bloomed into vision. It was antiquated here. Everything in the house was. The decor left a lot to be desired. The drapes were moth-eaten and dusty, but that was neither here nor there, as they were never used. Why should they be? There were no eyes for man nor beast that we had to block. There was a stag's head protruding from the wall, its fur somehow growing matted and in desperate need of grooming. I could only assume the occupants before us had placed their greasy, oily hands on the poor soul's bust. One of its antlers was broken in half, the missing counterpart nowhere to be found. The old table that sat in the middle of the room was sturdy, considering its scraped and effaced state, but the sturdiness was mostly due to the fact that some unknown master of DIY had affixed a great wooden block to a broken leg. More often than not in here, the generator gave way, and I had to wake my dad up early to go down to the basement and fix it. He had tried to show me how to do it, but outside of revving the little cord, I was at a loss. But if I was being honest, I didn't want to let them know that I could be relied on to do it. Especially since I was the one who woke first most times. The basement was old, dreary, dark. It was everything horror movies and childish nightmares gave warning klaxons about. I knew that there was never going to be some assailant waiting down there crouched and hidden in some corner, nor that there any supernatural entity, whether I believed in them or not, a constant battle of logic versus wild imagination, and would be drifting in miserably solitude in the dank subroom awaiting to harass me as I descended. But still, when your body tenses up, hairs stand on end, and goose pimples proliferate across your body as if each a vector of some diabolic, terror-fueled plague, it was best to pay heed and stay away. We have instincts for a reason after all. And fathers. With the humming bulb above, bravely illuminating the dated room against all odds, I checked the decking held tight around the walls of the old home. It was bathing in the weak glow coming from within, and I could see that it had rained in the night. The wood, dark and moist, was splintered and mossy, it rose only about a feet from the creeping weeds that were the duty of the temporary residents. It was usually my mother's job to wage war on those, but after realizing that they would forever grow back within a week, she made it a monthly job. I had escaped being drawn into that one thus far. I filled the kettle with water, which was thankfully as crystal clear as you would want water to be. Water, just like electricity, on demand, wasn't something that we could take for granted out here. I placed the old thing on its base, letting the little orange flickering light give me the cue to wait, and I rested my sleepy hat on the counter, humming some song that had wormed its way into my subconscious. I hummed because, should I try to find a lyric, I would be searching fruitlessly, the kettle started to roll and bubble behind me, but I decided to wait for the button to click up, and the unfurling steam to waltz carelessly into the slatted roof above, before I moved away from my current state of comfort. I opened the cupboard, lifting it up on the hinge which I learned quickly, and I fished out the rather bulbous baby blue mug that I had incidentally claimed as my own sense we were positioned here. And then I smiled to hear the little tinkle 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 of coffee granules at the base, and then I poured the boiling water in, letting the hypnotic steam 
heavy with the bitterness of the coffee, drift into my nostrils. I didn't take milk anymore. We had it, of course, but we'd only have a delivery every two months. And it was usually UHT milk or soya oat or almond variants, which I tended to prefer. But as a general rule, whoever had finished the last of the carton had to go and procure more from the stock, which was in the basement. No thank you, Mr. Non-Existing Ghost or Murderer. You won't get me today. Ah, crap. I uttered aloud, and the sound of my voice was strange when it was the only sound amidst such silence. I forgot to defrost and toast the bread. Loaves upon loaves frozen downstairs. But we usually had at least two in the freezer up here. But I quickly shrugged. Beggars can't be choosers. I opted for two rich tea digestives, the victuals my mother had fought for against my dad's commanding officers, and funnily enough, they seemed terrified of her. And so they sent them along with other provisions, more than she could eat, so it was never a point of contention within. Then, quite satisfied, I gave a cursory, greedy sip of the coffee as I always did, and regretted it, as I always did when the liquid has scolded my lips and tongue where it swelled. As if the biscuits had the power to extinguish the burn, I chomped at the edge of one. It didn't quell the burn, but at least it gave a sweet accompaniment. Then, having conducted my integral morning routines, I shuffled back upstairs, turning the light off as I ascended, condemning the rickety kitchen and mossy, dew-glistened deck to the pre-dawn darkness. I was cautious not to step on those snitching steps that groaned and creaked, which I didn't begrudge them. It was understandable in their old age. I crept across the landing, sticking to the edge for that same reason. I was always the villain if I awoke someone before the alarm clocks, and I traced my free hand across the wallpaper, a once white, now slightly yellowed canvas, with drooping tulips which had, over time, become victims to endless glare and began to fade. I continued past my room and opened the door which led to the attic. Strangely enough, I know that the top level of any house is as infamous for these same hidden assailants or vengeful poltergeists as the basement, but I never felt uneasy here. In fact, I felt very comfortable. Perhaps because this was decorated rather than old, cracked stone wall which was the backdrop to a network of rusting old pipes. The attic had the same wallpaper as the landing, and was home to old, dusty furniture. A sad old couch, brown and fraying, sat before a rug. I didn't dare move the rug ever, because I was loath to see what color lay beneath it, as the floor surrounding it was a murky, soiled variant, an aged echo of what it once was when this place was built. There were no lights in the ceiling here, something to do with the wiring not reaching all the way up. The house was built pre-electricity, and everything was installed naturally post-construction. The one window in the room sat as the main focal point on the other end of the room. A small box number with a chipped, cracked, and soft frame was now just a black patch. Only a few speckled stars offered respite from the darkness. Just next to it, at an angle was a high back chair, one of the legs replaced by a mound of books, none of which were of any note, I had checked them all out already. And beside that old thing was a little end table, a dark, varnished wood, flecked and chipped, ever the theme. It had a browned, aged doily resting atop it, and on that, that was an old lamp. This lamp for some reason always made me smile. It was quite a magnificent piece of furniture. There was a triangular chunk missing from the body of it. Little hairline cracks spread from this focal point, as if trying to escape slipping into the hole, like souls scrambling from the maws of hell. But it wasn't that I loved. It was just how disproportionate the lampshade was. The circumference was so bizarrely large that it seemed to more depict a possible orbit rather than a cute little halo of light. That too had been dirtied and dulled with disuse over time, but I didn't care. I switched it on, 
and plucked up my book, which I always left under the cushion. This I washed after it treated me to a coffee and fit one too many times. And then, with coffee, biscuits, and book, I lolled into my little reading nook and waited for the early hints of sunlight to clamor above the distant mountains. We had a small box TV in the lounge area, but as there was no signal, it was just old VHS or DVDs that other families had brought and left here. But as a rule, we tended to avoid using any unnecessary electricity. After a month, it was quite easy to grow accustomed to. The view was always stunning anyway, or at least it was before it was diluted by familiarity. I was always used to suburban life, and a little getaway like this would have been such a dream that my fancy for Halcyon, romanticized escapes always yearned for her. But it was funny how quickly I grew accustomed to this, and began to pine for what I considered mundane, such as street lamps and the distant grunt of passing vehicles. Still, we only had just over two months left of our six-month placement here. So, for posterity's sake, I came up here whenever I rose before the drowsy dawn to convince myself upon my return that I took full advantage of my time away. After about 30 to 40, and give or take a few, I started to see far in the restricted patch of distance offered from my dainty living canvas the unmistakable gradient of morning, a diluted pink that valiantly began to sail into the void, embracing it with a today pinkish hue. That was nice, and that meant that today was going to be warm, bright, and pleasant. Within an hour or two of the sunrise, the rain may have evaporated into a cold memory, and I may take my sister on a little adventure. It was rare that I left the house, but I liked to make a journey of it when I did. I closed my book with a muffled thump, and placed it on the doily at a tabletop. Doing so, I noticed that I had been so absorbed in my book that I had forgotten about my last biscuit and the dregs of coffee. I downed the drink. The sensation of the cold liquid was almost as unbearable as the scolding contrast I had suggested myself to earlier on. And as if someone may reach behind me and snatch the tree from my hands, I shoved the whole disc in my mouth and then snapped my teeth down. When we first came here, the winter was hard and brutal, and the journey over here was a turbulent. We had to drive from our home under heavy and black gathering clouds, which by the time we got under the small military transport ship, it had begun pouring forth with an insatiable primality. We docked at some nondescript island that was home to nothing but some old lab, as my dad called it, the people there weren't exactly the most scientific, in aesthetic or demeanor, but apparently were dealing with experiments which couldn't happen on the mainland. Nothing top secret, my dad assured me when I grew wide-eyed. Just stuff we can't really risk over there. A quick jerk of the head at that, though indicated clashing waves and darkened skies, I knew was the direction of home. We stayed there for the night, the four of us in one room, with creaky dorm beds, a brave heater buzzing away to keep us warm against the persistent gushing that clanged like steel drums on the corrugated steel roofing. The next day, we took advantage of the calmer weather, though it was still colder out here with no structures to break the salty, icy wind, and boarded the precarious-looking seaplane. I fell asleep, nursing a flask of coffee as the plane bounced and swayed. The large, noise-canceling headsets, which thankfully diluted the screaming engine and roaring wind, and replaced it with the inane chatter of the pilot to my dad. Then we were brought to the house. The mountains surrounding us were completely snow-capped, the grassland was frosted a solid white, and the island air was glacial. Thankfully, the family who were posted here just before us had left two days prior, so the house needed no assistance in settling. When I first found this little attic view, I had watched with an uneasiness through the frosted window, the edges and corners closing in with a frosted figonette. But as the pale sun had yawned awake, and I could see the view, with lingering mist enveloping the hills and rolling down to drift above the land, like a chorus of specters, 
I decided six months here wouldn't be all too bad. The view only got better as our esoteric world warmed though. The snow had melted, allowing us to see an army of trees and no longer shivering naked in the winter. And as if offering consolation for the bleakness that greeted us, a stretch of colorful flowers popped and bloomed all around. Venturing for as far as I could peer, crawling into the forest that started a fair distance from the foot of the mountain, and crawled all the way to the tip. Even now I could see it, almost as if alive, the trees bristling and basking in the warm stroke of sunlight. I struggled with the little drawer under the end table, which was less of a drawer and more of a test of strength, considering it forced you to pull it with all your might, before it finally opened and seemingly exploded. And then I took the binoculars out. I decided to leave the drawer open because closing it, jagged staccato shifts from side to side, was just not worth it until I was putting them back. The island wasn't all so much littered with wildlife. There were a few beasts of burden that had been placed here and allowed to graze freely. And the reason for this was, God forbid something awful happened, and either the supply drops that came every two months didn't make it for some reason or other. Whoever was on the island could in extreme circumstances take themselves out and before long bring meat enough to feed their family without having to worry about starving. Apparently, this had only ever happened once, and even then the supply drop was rectified within the week. Still, I like to scour the land to see any roaming sheep or flittling bird that had decided to roost here. When the notion took me, I would take my sister to the advancing forest and together we would search for bugs to bring back, or count how many nests that we could find. And I would always tell her there was a family of bears here, which sufficiently terrified her. I took in the view of the dew-kissed nature and enjoyed the little glistening dazzles of pink where the wetness caught the ever-blooming pink, like some great Grand Monarch's treasury. I often felt a little pride in this. Only a small number of people would ever see these sights, and the very vision that I was taking in I knew that the floral ancestry had only ever been witnessed by our predecessors. Whenever I stroked my hand amongst a tree, I let a scent of some unnamed flower tickle at my nose. It may have been the first human interaction in the entire history of the planet that had ever graced it. It was a bizarre feeling. I carried on scanning the land, feeling more and more like today may be an adventure day compelled by the tantalizing petrichor that was no doubt suffused in the morning breeze. I would maybe even take a trip to the mountaintop and get some nice landscape pictures to show my friends when I got home, or post up on the socials when signal was no longer a sweet, convenient memory. The trees were getting thicker and thicker in their foliage, but it should be easy to traverse without getting lost. My dad said if we ever go in there, it's easy to lose yourself because you're suddenly swallowed by a different biome altogether, and that the weather conditions here often just let the trees grow wildly. But if we were to ever get disoriented, to just carry on descending, because sooner or later we would break out of the perimeter, and our temporary home was visible enough once outside. I followed the small brook that was our main source of drinking water outside of the bottles, our tap water was from this reserve, bath water, etc. It snaked its way up in the mountain, just a meek little thing that froze over in the winter, near enough and it flooded in the rains. It was rushing today, the little white surf looking like an old, a faded scar, and just before the trees conspired to cover it from my view, an intense, haunting uneasiness stole over me. I dropped the binoculars in fright, even though the sudden clatter of them snapped me back to my sense, it felt like the time from dropping to collision was eons. I felt the nerves in my body tingle, traipsing down from my scalp to my toes in a fuzzy panic. A figure. A person. For a split second, I was certain that I saw someone out there, naked flesh and hunched over, cupping their hands into the stream. They looked emaciated, a near skeletal with pallid, clinging flesh. 
The brief flash of the hair showed a wild, unkempt and patched mass. The image that was now scorching itself into the forefront of my mind was more ghoul-like than human. My heart was storming a rapid beat, and I ducked to clutch the binoculars back, almost bruising my eyes with how hard I placed them to my face. I zoomed in, world shaking, quaking, trembling, and I scanned up and down the brook once more. It took a few seconds before I could stabilize my breathing enough so that the world wasn't just wild blurs. But nothing. No person, no trace, no evidence. It was impossible. I knew what I saw, but I couldn't have. To get here, anyone would have to... No, it was impossible. But what else could it have been? I was too clued up about normalcy bias to start doubting my own experience. There was no animal that it could have been, but we were so far away. A boat to a classified island, and then a seaplane. I couldn't focus. I scanned as much as I could, just waiting to see a slither, a flash of flash somewhere out in the distance. But nothing. No one. I instantly retreated from the window and scrambled backward. I didn't know much of my dad's job here, but... I knew that it was of utmost importance to national security. If someone was here, if something was here, it couldn't be a positive thing. Shaking, terrified, I crept away from the small window, the sunlight beaming through and giving stage to a flurrying world of dust particles. The intense sensation of distress was mounting, and then beneath me, I heard a chorus of screeching. As the alarms in the house began to drag everyone from their sleep. This was good. Because I had to tell my dad what I just saw. Four American anthropologists went into a remote village in Colombia. I was the sole survivor. Written by Cal is writing. I stared at the three passport photos in black and white. When the embassy officer asked me how the three American students had died, all I could tell them was to go look in the ravine outside of the Pueblo. The place is called Kukuri, a remote village in the department of Kaka, located smack dab in the Cordillera Occidental. The Pueblo is difficult to reach, involving various ferry crossings, bus rides, and a five-day mule trek through the Colombian highlands. It was here that I had escaped by the skin of my teeth with my life, hiding in the dense forests of the mountains while being pursued on foot. The name is Adam Roscoe. I'm a fourth-year anthropology graduate student at Dartmouth, and my research focuses on the religious practices of South America and the Caribbean. A colleague and a research partner of mine, Mateo, was recently awarded a group research grant to study religious anthropology in South America by the department. We were researching different destinations. These shamans of the Kachi people in northwest Ecuador. The emergence of the Pentecostalism in urban Brazil. The Interimi in Cusco, Peru. It wasn't until Mateo suggested to the group in a small village that we had never heard of that we arrived at a group consensus. Kukuri, he said, pointing on a map of Colombia, his finger landing on a dot in the southwestern part of the country. It's absolutely fascinating, man. I've only read about it recently, but it's a village that is so isolated in the mountains that they were barely touched by the Spanish. They still practice an ancient, pre-Columbian belief system. And there's this festival. Festival de la Madera Talada. The festival of the carved wood. Where the villagers would all carve these wooden religious sculptures. Nobody's written about this and it's not in the literature as far as I can find. We need to check it out. It was the four of us. All anthro grad students. Mateo, Louis, and Carol. Paperwork was absolutely awful, as the Department of State declared this region that we were to visit, Kaka, as incredibly unsafe due to crime and lingering dissident FARC activity in the area. However, after renewing our passports and receiving a barrage of shots for a variety of tropical diseases, we were ready to disembark for Bogota. 
None of us spoke Spanish except for Mateo, whose family hailed from Barranquilla. As a result, Mateo was the de facto leader of the expedition, helping us navigate transportation and hotels as we traveled southwards through the country towards a town called Popayan, with beautiful whitewashed colonial buildings. In Popayan, it took us almost two weeks to find a guide willing to take us to Kukuri. For some reason, almost everybody we went to flat out refused, even when we had mentioned the name. Our guide, Eulalio, went by the nickname El Indio, and was the only person who was willing to take us. In fact, he seemed almost excited to take us, four Americans, to his home village. Eulalio could only manage a few phrases of English, so for the most part he talked to Mateo who then translated it for the rest of the group. However, Eulalio did tell us that he could speak the obscure tribal language known as Kencha, preserved in time from a Spanish influence to this day. The journey was long, arduous, and really hot. And the mosquitoes, oh there were so many mosquitoes. However, as we began to ascend the mountains, the weather began to become more temperate, and then slightly chilly. All of us had never been hiking in our lives and the altitude sickness was an absolute bear. Eulalio gave us some leaves from a shrub to chew on. It was bitter and it didn't taste great, but it helped to alleviate the overwhelming nausea. We ate packed tamales for five days straight, which was okay for the first day but became tiresome after the fourth. After trekking through the dense valleys and cliffs on a small, barely visible trail, we could finally see the site of the village. The first thing that I noticed about the village was its location. It overlooked a massive cliff with a drop that must have been at least 5,000 feet. The village was still very underdeveloped with wooden houses and traditional thatched roofs. We could see clothes hung on clotheslines from trees and children kicking a half-deflated soccer ball around. We arrived close to sunset and as we entered Kukuri, the women brought up platters of traditional food, including what I later was told were roasted guinea pigs. They embraced Eulalio and talked with him and Kensha while we stood there and awkwardly smiled. The kids all came out and began to stare at us as if they had never seen a white person before, which in all likelihood they hadn't. And being completely exhausted after my journey, I was looking forward to a warm mattress. To my consternation, that was not what we got. As guests, we stayed in a small wooden house with a dirt floor on some wooden cots that were murder on my scoliosis. The bathroom was just a wooden bucket that we had to empty into a ditch twice a day. Water here was a precious commodity, so we only showered twice a week. The villagers were friendly and welcoming though, and they were always curious. After a week, we were able to mutually communicate using a series of grunts and hand gestures. The festival de la Madera Talada, which in Kenchi was something that I will not even attempt to transliterate, was what we later found out to be a month-long affair that took place over the month of January. There were various parades with men in elaborately carved masks accompanied with music that wind into the streets of the village. There was a lot of food, some really good like the roasted goat, and others a bit too adventurous for my palate. Festivities took place around a central building which we initially thought was a church. The four of us toured the building. It was the largest building in town with elaborate carved indigenous designs on wooden panels all over the interior. There were no pews or chairs, and the villagers simply sat on the dirt floor. The center of the building was a wooden statue and what appeared to be an altar. And we thought that the statue was a version of one of the Virgin Marys that you could see in most Latin American churches, but upon closer inspection, it wasn't. You see, instead of the graceful open palm gesture of the Marys, the statue's hands were tied at the wrist. What we thought was a halo was in fact a feather headdress. The woman wore a dress tied around the waist and had a stoic expression. This was strange because when you move closer to the statue, 
you realize that there was something carved around her neck. It looked like a string necklace. We decided to interview the elders of the village for our research, and the process went like this. We would ask the question in English. Mateo would translate into Spanish. Ilulio would uh, translate from Spanish to Kanchi, and the elders would respond in Kanchi, and then all the way back again. This was long and arduous, but we had no other way to do it. We inquired about the church. The elders laughed. It wasn't a church like the Christianos have. It was a shrine dedicated to Yuxitak, the mountain god. The more we inquired about the religion of the village, the more we realized just how old it was. It predated the arrival of Columbus, of course, but it predated even the Incas. Perhaps a connection can be traced between the village and the Muisca civilization, which inhabited the area beginning in 600 CE, but we couldn't be sure. In summation, we found that there was an entire pantheon of deities and spirits. The chief among them was Yuxitak, the creator mountain deity. The festival was in honor of Yuxitak for the celebration of a prosperous harvest and the bounty of the coming growing season. Outside of the shrine, villagers were already hauling large blocks of the Encilino tree to carve. And we were told that the legend goes that long ago, the chief of their people absconded with the consort of Yuxitak. Angered, Yuxitak caused the crops to fail and die, causing mass starvation. To appease the god, the villagers would carve these elaborate wooden statues of the god for worship and procession around the village. And there was also another part, a yearly sacrifice, but we weren't given many details beyond that. The procession would take place with the young girls wearing the same feather headdresses that we saw in the statue holding torches, leading the procession. We were later told that these girls were around the age of 13, all virgins and premenstrual. Men would then carry the wooden statues on platforms, followed by musicians with flutes and drums. The old woman would gather behind them and sing sullen dirges and weep, like at a funeral. We asked Eulilio why they were singing like that. He says they're weeping, Mateo translated. What are they weeping for? Mateo faltered. The one that is chosen to be the new bride of Yuxitak. Almost at the edge of the cliff, villagers were busy carving a massive, two story tall visage of the god. The god had bold, glaring eyes and a gaping jaw with sharp teeth. The face was bigger than the body, and the head was adorned with an elaborate feather headdress, similar to what the girls were wearing. Throughout the festival, Men wearing white robes chiseled away at the idol. Towards the week three of the festival, things began to get a bit rowdy. Men would drink an egregious amount of ashika, a native corn beer, and began to drunkenly chant and wander through the village with a lash made of bristles. They began to chase anybody who stood by watching and began to beat them with a the lash. This ritual was said to symbolize a Yuxitak searching for his bride and punishing any human that he came across. The women of the village then served us a special beverage just for us four that was called Yupa. It was a clear yellow and didn't smell very good. Ilulio was not given a cup either. Do we have to drink it? Mateo grunted and elbowed me as he downed the liquid. He grimaced. Ah, uh, it's so bitter. Lewis and Carol followed suit, but I didn't. The woman that handed me the beverage urged me to drink it. No, oh, it's okay, I'm fine, thank you. I tried to gesture that I didn't want the drink. She insisted. I began to sip the drink from the cup. It was very bitter and almost had an analgesic effect on my mouth. When she wasn't looking, I spit it out on the ground. The culmination of the festival was La Ceremonia, an elaborate ritual involving the entire village that occurred in front of the statue by the cliff. Dozens of the most beautiful young maidens of the village danced in rhythm to the beating of a solo drum. The elders gathered at the forefront of the crowd, 
eyeing every movement. The villagers would then nod in point and the girl being indicated would then bow before exiting the dance. This kept on happening until only one girl was left. The chief elder stood up, closed his eyes and held up his hands, and said something directed at the statue. He was then handed an obsidian knife. The maiden bowed her head and approached. I became really uneasy. Do you notice that she's dressed like that statue we saw at the shrine? I whispered to Mateo. I think something's about to happen. Mateo didn't respond, and I glared at him. His eyelids began to slide close as he leaned over in a stupor. And Carol and Lewis also looked sleepy. I elbowed them to wake up, but they didn't seem to respond. The girl then held out her palms, and the chief then sliced a cut on each palm. He then replaced her smaller, feathered headdress with a larger, more elaborate headdress. She then approached the foot of the statue, looked at the statue, and then uttered something. She then slid her palm on the foot of the statue, smearing her blood on the wood. The chief then shouted something triumphantly, and the rest of the village chanted in reply. The girl, who looked no older than twelve, then put her arms behind her back meekly, as two men came behind her and bound her hands with rope. She then approached the edge of the cliff and stood there, stoic as the statue that we saw. The chief then slowly walked behind her and put his hands on her shoulder. He then took out his knife. It was that moment that I realized, to my horror, that the statue of the girl wasn't wearing a necklace. It was a slit throat. In one swooping motion, the chief lifted the head of the girl by her hair and sliced the knife across her throat. Her body went limp. I audibly gasped. The chief then threw her body over the cliff and into the ravine below. He turned around, hands bloody. He then raised his knife in triumph as the men of the village raised their fists and shouted. Ilulio stood up and shouted something at the chief. He then pointed at us, the Americans. By now, Mateo, Lewis, and Carol all had fallen over asleep. I urgently tried to shake them away, but their arms remained limp. Yulio then stood over me and said in very rough English, You next. The men began to come towards us with rope in their hands. They bound the hands of my unconscious colleagues while I began to struggle and shout. I kicked the men and broke out of their grasp and began to run for the entrance of the village. Two of the men grabbed spears and began to run after me. I ran out of the village, screaming for help before I realized the futility of it all. I was a white American in an isolated village in the middle of the Andes surrounded by hostile villagers. I ran, panicked, searching for the trails. I could hear their footsteps around me and men shouting in Kenja. I eventually reached a path that cut across a cliff that looked over the village. As I paused to catch my breath, I could see three figures being held by men standing behind the edge of the cliff. They all made the same sweeping motion before shoving their bodies into the ravine. All I could do was run. I would like to take a moment to talk about today's Creepscast sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef is the most sustainable meal kit available on the market and they make eating while easy with plans to fit every lifestyle. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat more balanced meals, Green Chef offers a range of recipes to suit your preferences. The thing I really appreciate about Green Chef is that they offset 100% of their plastic packaging in every box and 100% of their carbon footprint in emissions. Taking care of our planet is about as important as it gets, so I always love to see companies taking steps in the right direction. Not only are they environmentally conscious, they're also downright delicious. With fresh produce, premium proteins, and organic ingredients you can trust, you'll love every meal that gets delivered to your door. The Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there is something for everyone. I love switching between the brands and now my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. 
go to greenchef.com slash mrcreep130 and use code mrcreep130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Again, that's greenchef.com slash mrcreep130 and use code mrcreep130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. The desolation at Sentinel Peak Fire Watch will haunt me forever. Written by Kyle Harrison. Our plane cropped over the horizon, the endless woods meandering and covering every inch of land for miles around the forested area, effectively isolating it from the rest of the earth by mountains on almost all sides. Within the bowl-shaped valley of greenery, it was easy to spot where we were headed. The blackened tower stood out like an altar of ash amid the lush firs. As we got closer, a memory flashed in my head about the conversation I had had with the chief forest officer, Vince Wesley, only the day before in Ontario. The incident happened over the winter break. A couple of blokes from Cali came in to do the watchman duty for some extra cash. Probably needed it for the holidays and heaven's sakes. You know we've been short-handed lately. Nate, it's not like I had a choice. I figured they would basically be holed up in that tower for a couple of weeks with nothing to do. But whack off and smoke weed or whatever. They seemed harmless. So then what happened? I remembered asking. Paul says that it was our son. I thought it was an accident. I guess that's why we called you, huh? Ain't you the expert? I didn't bother telling him that it had been about four years since I had been involved in any official investigation like this. Truth be told, I was a little like those kids, eager for cash and down on my luck. Since this seemed like an open and shut case, I thought I would be here for a day at the most. Slowly, we declined towards the south part of the lake shore, the plane gliding gracefully across the top of the morning fog, as I got a better look at the fire watch station. It surprised me to see how much it was still standing. From this angle at least, half of the building looked like it was untouched, perhaps more. Built of steel and stone and a mix of cement and wood, it should have collapsed if the fire was as intense as Vince had claimed it to be especially if it had started from within. As the seaplane came to a stop, I stopped an officer coming to meet me. His smile was friendly, but a few bruises and a cast on his knee told me that the older man hadn't had a very pleasant Christmas. You must be the inspector, Nathan, right? He said as he leaned on his good leg. Yeah, just call me Nate. Sorry it took a little longer than expected to get here. Hard to find a pilot that wants to fly this time of year, I guess. I told him as I gathered my things. I hadn't packed much again. Expecting this to be a short trip since the station itself was not much larger than an average two-bedroom cabin. Not even a change of clothes. Nah, it's this place. Nobody likes to come up to Sentinel Peak. They say it's got bad mojo. He teased. I pointed toward the abandoned lookout and commented, Given recent events, I can't blame them. We stood there for an awkward moment while he peered up toward the stairwell that led to the main lookout, perhaps speculating what had happened. And then he clasped his hands together and helped with my backpack. Well, um, the tower ain't going nowhere. Let me show you where you'll be staying, he said. The seaplane captain waved us off and then we were alone. As I watched its reflection disappear from the surface of the water, I realized just how alone we were. The valley seemed endless. The sky was so quiet. And the tower suddenly seemed a bit more imposing as I stood there at its feet. Have you been up there since it happened? I asked. What? Oh, heck no. We needed to preserve the crime scene and all that. He immediately shouted. I nodded absently, wondering why I had even considered he might have any information to give me. So I pulled my pack a little closer to me, 
and followed him down a winding trail toward what looked like a small recreational vehicle. Huh? <laughs> Best we could do given the circumstances. Honestly, Sentinel Peak is a pretty lonely place, so besides this lookout, there ain't much up here. He explained as he led me inside. There were two small beds, a few cabinets, a mini kitchen and toilet, and maybe enough food for a few days. I don't really think that I'm going to be here for that long. I told him as he offered me a cup of coffee. Sure, but this is better than being outside. Bears in these parts get hungry this time of year since. There's not much else in the area to eat. They get a little desperate, he commented. We both pulled up a chair and I got the feeling that if I was going to get this investigation done, it would require that I cooperated with him. So, the bodies. Will that attract bears too? I asked. There weren't any bodies, mate. I guess that whoever did it hightailed it out of here after the deed was done. He explained. I thought they died in the incident. I said, recalling what Vince had told me. If they did, then the fire ate them up, I guess. But people go missing around here pretty often, he said, sipping his hot beverage. Something about what he was telling me didn't add up, so I decided to change the subject. You mentioned earlier not many people come here, right? So, what's the lookout tower even for? There's a lumber company a few miles east of here in the valley, well, I guess there was one until a few years back. Everything with the pandemic didn't pass us by and the company fell into bankruptcy, he answered. So it's just sitting there untouched. They left all their equipment behind. That's what seems to happen around here. People come and try to make this area theirs and Mother Nature fights back, pushes us back. I've often felt like we weren't welcome here. There's a force that doesn't want us here, he said. I sat there for an awkward moment as he stared at me stone-faced and then he laughed. I really had to go in there for a second, didn't I? I sighed and looked down at the coffee, realizing that I didn't really feel comfortable being here longer than necessary. I think I'm going to go up to the lookout now, see what I can find out, I said as I stood up and stretched. Sure, but it's going to get dark soon. I can get some pork and beans going if you want first. Uh, maybe warm that up in about an hour. By then, I should have this wrapped up. I said as I walked out of the small mobile home. The air around me felt still, and I walked up the trail toward the tower, my imagination playing out what I might find. As I took a first step onto the wooden stairwell, the entire lookout made a creaky noise and I froze for a moment, wondering how secure this place was. It didn't look too unstable, but it didn't make me feel safe when every step I made caused more noise to resound through the valley. As I climbed above the tree line, it felt like I was going into the clouds, getting a chance to see the forest from a different view. Here at this level, it was an ocean of firs and pines, easy to get lost in, or drown in the endless green. The signs of the fire became evident when I made the next round of stabs, some of them bent and warped by the flames. And then it got worse at the next level, turning completely to black ash as I reached the top. The door was barely on its hinges, the gentle breeze inviting me to go in, and to see what had occurred. I took out my smartphone to get a good bit of light, as I saw the sun was beginning to set over the forest and I went in. The smell of ash mixed with burnt flesh as my tiny light illuminated the destruction. There really wasn't a part of the small building that hadn't been completely burnt up by the fire. Books and furniture were blackened or completely disintegrated, the metal chairs were melted and twisted, the computers broken and leaning toward the center of the room. It seemed clear the fire had started there, near where a small coffee table had once sat. In its place now, there was a deep scar that seemed to infect the very ground. 
a dark black spot that spread out its tentacles in all directions. Yet then, as I turned toward the other side of the fire watch, I realized that most of it was untouched. As though the flames had mysteriously stopped, when reaching a certain intensity. The couch was sitting there, looking toward the inferno as though entertained by the immolation, and beyond it, the kitchen looked perfectly intact. Why hadn't the volunteers simply used this as their exit strategy? I wondered as I stepped toward the tiny restroom and saw where one of them had spent their final few moments. The corpse was darker than the starry sky that was meshing with the old building. His body collapsed and hugging the toilet as though he had been vomiting. Yet the appearance of his body, frozen now by the after effects of the inferno, did not indicate that this man was hiding here and hoping to remain safe from the blaze. Instead, it told me that whatever had happened was swift, so unexpected that they didn't even have time to protect their body as they had hurled into the portageon one last time. How was that possible? I've studied quick brush fires for most of my life in this job, and I had never seen one burn so powerfully and so quickly. And the second corpse was nowhere in sight. Had the second man escaped and just decided to bolt, the fire was to be considered intentional, according to the brief report that Paul had given me, and his number one suspect was this missing man, I was sure. I needed to find more about them. I decided as I checked the kitchen for any evidence of using the back entrance to get out and climb down. Yet also, I couldn't seem to find any accelerant or cause for the blaze itself. It was as though it had simply appeared out of nowhere. I knew not to prejudge the entire situation, but something wasn't adding up and I felt like I was being lied to. I could think of many reasons why that would be, most of them involving money. I took pictures of the burnt office one more time and I prepared to leave, resolving to get the truth from Paul that night. Another thing that was off was the entire vibe of the fire watch. I've always felt that when I visit the aftermath of an incident such as this, they are devoid of life. Yet, as I left the empty building, I had this eerie feeling that someone was watching me. There's a force that doesn't want us up here, Paul had said. I had no idea if he was being serious or if it was another part of this strange case. There were too many questions. I stopped midway down the tower to take a smoke and look out at the tree line. The sun was down now, and all they could make out were the dark outlines of the firs and the cedars. Forest stretches out like an ocean here, and you can watch the wind ripple across the tops of these trees like gentle waves. But what I saw that night wasn't the wind. I was thinking about just forgetting this whole thing. Signing the paper and calling it a night when I saw something move in the trees. And then I realized it was actually a tree itself. One of the dark cedars seemed to gently walk across the horizon as though it had legs. I fumbled and tried to make sure that I wasn't seeing things. It was so dark that I thought my eyes had to be playing tricks on me so I ran up toward the tower to use the spotlight and get a better look at it. I angled the mighty metallic object, trying to get a good idea of where the strange tree had disappeared to and then turning it on. A long stream of light pierced the night. What I saw, I'm not sure I truly believe or understand. The tree looked like it had a face. Sharp bark contoured and opened into a hollow hole that formed a mouth with sharp edges of broken branches that were meant as teeth. Its body was as wide as a house, and its legs were taller than a giraffe. They seemed to spread out and cover the ground, twisting and snagging the soil as it moved toward the fire watch. I heard a low, bellowing noise, like a grenade going off and then a sharp, pitched shriek. Immediately, I shut the spotlight off and ran. I pushed down the stairs and toward the trail, running for Paul's trailer. As I got inside and slammed the door, his face was a look of confusion and amusement. Don't tell me you didn't hear that, 
I asked. He switched off his TV and shrugged. Eventually, all the wood starts sounding the same. What did you see? He asked. I took a moment to recompose myself and stood up straight. It was nothing. I'm just tired, I told him. You look worse than that. Pa muttered as he offered me some food and grabbed a bug. I was beginning to wonder what was taking you so long up there. It's nearly morning, he said. I found myself looking like a drunk girl at a frat house party, peeking through the blinds to be sure he was right. It only felt like 20 minutes at most, I whispered. Paul stood there for a moment, probably trying to decide if I had lost my mind before turning to brew his coffee. So, what was it like up there? He asked, munching on his breakfast. I sat down, still unsettled by all that I had seen and trying to make sense of it. Can you tell me more about the volunteers? I asked. I took out my recorder to be sure that I didn't miss any of the details. Wow, this must be serious if you're doing all that. Pa gasped and then cleared his throat. Well, they seemed like nice enough fellas. I never really bothered to get to know them. This time of year, I'm farther south where we expect to see campers coming in for the holiday. Like I said, no one ever really bothers with a Sentinel Peak. It's almost forgotten entirely. So, you weren't here when the fire happened, I guessed. I came to do a check on them. Volunteers are supposed to check in with the ranger's office on a semi-weekly basis, and they had missed a couple of times. A rookie mistake, but I wanted to be sure. When I got over the ridge, I saw the smoke rising and I called it in, he said. Vince said you thought it was arson, though. Why would you jump to that conclusion? I asked. Well, I guess I should have brought it up earlier, but our park has been getting threats lately, he admitted. Threats? Like from tree huggers or something? I asked. Paul laughed but nodded as he sipped his coffee. Sentinel Peak is a relic and they want it torn down. Let the forest grow up and push us out. To be honest, before this incident, I was really considering that. Let the ghosts have this place. Nature doesn't want us here anyway, he insisted. I recalled the strange things that I had seen only moments ago. When you say that, what do you mean? Has the Firewatch had issues in the past? I asked. Hasn't been the first time he lost some volunteers. Vince didn't tell you that, did he? It's one of the main reasons we can't keep good folk. Everyone's scared that they'll wind up disappearing. Paul joked. What do you mean? Have there been other incidents? Not like this. But here and there, one of the volunteers will go missing from the Firewatch. Their partner usually has to finish it all solo, although half of them just pack up and leave. I would too if I was doing this all alone, and my only help vanishes. When you say vanish, it makes it sound like they don't just grab a flight and go home. Are you saying these people are never seen again? Why haven't they been reported? I asked. Paul looked at me like I was joking and he sighed before explaining. People go missing in these woods all the time. We don't have the budget to search unless someone reports them. These folks that disappear, I guess no one cared. I put down the recorder, recalling that I had only seen one corpse in the fire watch. But something different happened this time. I commented as I looked out the window toward the burnt building. Paul, I need you to identify the body that I found. Can you do that? And did you get a good look at these kids? He seemed surprised but went along with it as he grabbed his coat and he walked back toward the tower. And my hope was once we realized which body was in the tower, it could help us begin a search for the survivor to determine if this was really arson or something else entirely. I thought this as I unlatched the door. As we stepped in, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, 
Paul held his hand over his face as we closed the door back and I took a second look at the devastation. Everything had changed. Unlike before when I was looking at the front half of the building, now everything in the kitchen was torched and destroyed. The living room and the bathroom seemed unfazed, and the body that I had encountered earlier was also missing. Instead, as we walked to the desiccated kitchen, I saw a different corpse covered in ash, this one staring out the window. Looking straight toward the trees that I had seen moving only a few hours ago, they had been preparing to bite down on an apple when the fire had engulfed them. I can't tell which one this is. I'm sorry. Paul admitted as he tried not to gag, but my head was still spinning from the strange change in the room. There was no way I had seen the same devastation earlier. I pulled my phone out and looked at the photographs, confirming that I hadn't simply been seeing things. This isn't natural. It wasn't arson, and it wasn't an accident either. In fact, I'm not sure what happened here, I told him. I let Paul look at the pictures that I had taken to judge his reaction. His face told me that he was just as baffled as me, and frightened too. I don't think we should stay here, he admitted. I disagree. Something unnatural is going on here. And that's exactly why we need to stay, I said as I put my equipment down on the couch. If we stay, it could reveal what had caused all of this, I suggested. He seemed uncomfortable but couldn't give me an excuse to leave, so we both started gathering samples of the burnt materials from the kitchen to test. It could reveal a lot about the fire, I told him as I checked the time. Strange, I thought. It felt as though no amount of time had passed since we had arrived, yet I was exhausted. Was something affecting us mentally here as well? We kept gathering materials for another hour or so, as I felt my energy drain more and more. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the need to collapse on the couch and rest. Paul was complaining that he was feeling nauseous. I think it's these burnt bodies. I don't see how you can stomach any of this, he told me. I ignored him and I closed my eyes, trying to relax and let my mind unwind. Instead, it wasn't long before it felt that I was unraveling. Paul grabbed my shoulders and shook me awake, his eyes confused. Hey, why are you asleep? He asked me as he pointed toward the window. Can't you hear that? It was the booming noise again. The one that made my entire body tremble. I stood up, my knees wobbling as I heard the ground around our tower start to crumble. What is that? I asked. I can't see anything. It's been going on for about ten minutes. I think it's going to tear us limb from limb. Paul shouted. I raced to the kitchen to get a better look. The glowing eyes of the strange monster in the trees making me want to run the other way. Instead, a swath of fire pushed itself into the tower, covering the counter next to me and making me leap back. The entire counter was covered in flames. Paul ran to grab an extinguisher and doused the small inferno as the monster bellowed and the firewatch shook. We need to get out of here, I said as I ran away from the kitchen. He was standing there at the counter, trying to protect what little was left. Instead, the flames covered his body, the way that ants attack an invasive predator. It made it seem like the fire had a mind of its own. Immediately, I ran from the tower, not bothering to look back. I could hear the gigantic noises from above, and I was sure that if I hesitated for even a moment, the entire firewatch would fall down on top of me. I didn't stop running until I made it to Paul's trailer. I found the radio and I called Vince's station. Mayday, mayday, this is Sentinel Peak, requesting assistance. There was only static as I heard the creature moving about outside, trying to find me. I could hear the crackling of fire. Was it really going to burn down the whole forest just to exterminate me? I hunched down and waited for the woods to become silent again, and then I heard Vince on the radio. 
Sentinel Pig, do you copy? I grabbed the receiver and shouted, There's a fire. Send help right away. All rangers need evacuation immediately. The radio filled with static again, and then it died. And then I heard a knock on the door. Instinctively, I grabbed the nearest object to use as a weapon. A letter opener, and I stood by the door to let the stranger in. To my shock and confusion, it was Paul. You're alive? How is that possible? I saw you burning up, I said. He didn't even show signs of scars on his body. He looked just as confused as me. Who the heck are you? He spat back. What? Is this some kind of joke? It's Nathan. I came here to inspect the fire. I kept my distance from him, wondering if he was even the same person that I had met the day before. Had the fire done something to him? Recreated him somehow? Paul mumbled something into his walkie-talkie and then he answered, What fire? We walked out of his trailer and I looked up at Sentinel Peak. It appeared untouched by any blaze at all. What in the world? I said as I started to run toward the stairs. There were no signs of ash or burns or anything that I had seen before. I heard Paul shouting to me as I raced to the top. I needed to see the inside of the fire watch. I needed to understand what was happening. As I stepped into the tower, I found myself looking at a brand new office, polished furniture, a full pantry. It looked like nothing had been used. Paul stormed in behind me. Please explain to me what's going on here, he demanded. There is a fire here. You died. Maybe I died too, I whispered. It was making me nauseous. I was seeing flashes of this other fire watch, where Paul was devoured by the inferno, and I was the one trapped in the bathroom. We were the ones who came here. We're trapped inside a nightmare of our own design. That creature, it's made us a part of the forest. Paul was reaching for his gun, clearly disturbed by everything that I said. You need to leave now, he warned. Listen to me. We have to stop it before it happens again. But instead of listening, he fired a shot straight toward me. I ducked down and the bullet hit the propane tank right behind me. The explosion forced me toward Paul, a burst of fire consuming the front of the station. The entire fire watch was covered in an inferno within mere moments. I found myself trying to grab a hold of the splintering wood as the tower crumbled. I was being swallowed up by the devastation, seeping into the very ground. I lost consciousness at some point, hardly able to move from the blast. The fire watch was gone, but something else now was rumbling toward me. It was the giant. I tried to move and to run, but instead, I realized that my body was trapped by the rubble of the collapsed tower. The monster was reaching down, its massive branches digging up the debris and picking me up as a ragdoll. Vines encircled my legs to prevent me from being able to escape as I swung up toward the giant's neck. Its glowing eyes were looking into my soul and it opened its sharp bark mouth to spread fire over my body. My skin was burning, my body felt paralyzed, and I was becoming a part of this massive tree creature. As it happened, I saw a forest being scorched in front of my eyes. I was taken on an astral journey through the body of this creature. I saw its kind, helplessly watching as man came and tore down the forest, fighting back and taking all they could. Sentinel Peak was one of the few places these creatures still called home, and then the forest rangers that built the station. I saw how the tree had to watch on these sidelines as its own brothers and sisters were destroyed. I felt its pain every time they attacked the forest. It happened not once or even a dozen times, but thousands of times, in that the creature could do nothing. By some miracle, perhaps magic or a sacred power of the land itself, the tree found the will to walk and to attack. The fire watch needed to be taken down for these people had no purpose here. 
I recalled Paul's words about how useless it was and now I could see why. These people were wasting resources that belonged to the forest. This was a fight that humanity would lose. I watched as the tree monster used its newfound strength to burn the tower down, the fragments of the earth sorting into different pieces. Each part of these scattered memories were the earth itself, broken and disjointed more than any mere words could convey. It was trying to put itself back together and frozen in time itself, and we were causing it more and more suffering. The giant said nothing, letting me experience all these painful things as I was transported to the edge of the valley, watching as the destruction of the Firewatch put itself back together again. And then the tree was silent and frozen, as if never a monster at all, and I'm as human as I had always been. I stood there for a moment, looking toward a sentinel peak and trying to make sense of this strange, otherworldly experience that I had had. I had been given the gift of seeing the world through the eyes of nature, understanding its pain. I saw Paul walking towards me, waving his arms and looking like a fool. Another typical human destroying this blessed land. You must be the new recruit. Come on up, the place is waiting for you, he said. He guided me and told me all about the Firewatch and its long history, but I wasn't listening. I was looking at the place and how easy it would be to torture it. I waited for him to leave and thanked him, checking my phone and deleting the old photos. The past was removed. Nature healed itself the way that it always does, and now I can play a part and make sure it's completely cured. I doused the fire watching gasoline and then looked toward the forest horizon as I set a match and let the fire begin to burn. I am part of the desolation now. I am the ash that smolders and lingers and returns to the earth. This place will be forgotten. It will return to what it once was. But we of the forest, we will continue to remain. Forever a memory of the suffering that we can endure. I received a disturbing message from Mars. We must never visit. Written by Kyle Harrison. Approximately 334 days ago, according to the Martian calendar, NASA began to use the Perseverance rover for research of the Red Planet. Thanks to the rover, we have learned more about our distant neighbor this year than ever before. But not all of it is for the betterment of mankind. Two microphones aboard the rover have been recording the winds of the Red Planet for quite some time, trying to determine the acoustic differences between our world and Mars. Mars has an unusual atmosphere compared to this planet, with very different temperature, density, and chemistry. These differences have three main effects on the sound you'd hear. The speed of sound. Sounds emitted in the cold Martian atmosphere take a slightly longer to get to your ear, with an average surface temperature around negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Mars has a lower speed of sound, around 540 miles per hour, compared to about 760 miles per hour on Earth. You probably wouldn't notice up close, but over longer distances, you definitely would. Imagine trying to hear the roar of a fire only to realize that the house you were getting to had already been burned down. The volume of sound. The level you hear will also be automatically lower on Mars. The Martian atmosphere is about 100 times less dense than on Earth. That is, there is just a lot less of it. And that affects how sound waves travel from the source to the detector, resulting in a softer signal. On Mars, you would have to be much closer to the source of a sound to hear it at the same volume as you would on Earth. The Quality of Sound The atmosphere of Mars, which is made up of 96% carbon dioxide, absorbs a lot of higher pitch sounds, so only lower pitch sounds travel long distances. 
This effect is known as attenuation, a weakening of these signal at certain frequencies, and it would be more noticeable the farther you were from the source. Put together, these three impacts change how you or anything would sound in the atmosphere of Mars. Imagine that, the surprise felt when it was recorded only a week ago, what sounded like a screaming. Now I was at my station, reviewing the audio and barely drifting off to the ambience that was carrying through the microphones, when this extremely high-pitched shriek pierced the airwaves. Immediately, I fumbled with my gear, snatching the headphones off as I felt my heartbeat faster than it ever had before. I took a moment to recompose, and then placed the headphones back on to listen. The noise was gone, but it did feel like there were reverberations from it everywhere in the audio. There was this low thrill that filled the void from the shriek. Hesitantly, I rewound the audio, turning the volume to a lower frequency so it wouldn't hurt my ears. Ordinarily, to get proper analysis, we are told to not do this, but the situation was unique and I figured it would be easier to handle the screams if they didn't terrify me. What I heard disturbed me beyond what mere words can describe. The best way to offer an explanation would be to provide you with an anecdote from my childhood. I had a dog named Brutus when I was little. A large Labrador retriever that could hold his ground against the toughest predators out there. One time I swear that I saw him run off a bear. This dog was loyal. He would always go with us hunting and making sure that we were protected. It was like he had eyes on the back of his head. One particular hunt, my brother and I decided to go out when it was storming in to try and find a few deer that enjoyed grazing after a soft rain. Yet this storm hadn't quite passed us yet, and I fell into this muddy ditch. Brutus came slipping and sliding right behind me. His leg got caught by this gnarly thorn branch and he let out this yelp that pierced the rain. I got up and tried to help him, but it was like attempting to wrangle the fish as it flopped from the water. Brutus was confused, terrified and struggling so much that it was only making his pain worse with each passing moment. We couldn't seem to pull him free. I told my brother to go get our dad to try to find a rope and we could perhaps snag the branch up and free Brutus. Meanwhile, he continued to whine and yelp, the thorns digging into his leg muscles the more he fought against the snare. There ain't no way to move that branch, it's too muddy. I don't have any good equipment. Dad told us when he assessed the situation. He told us to leave Brutus in there and that he would go figure it out. But he didn't. Instead, as my brother and I went home, I could hear my dog's shrieks echo across the night air. The sound of suffering, endless pain, and with each new yelp, it became worse. The sounds across the airwaves of Mars reminded me of my dog and how he died that night caught in the mud. I was helpless to save them, as helpless as I was to find out the truth about these recordings. I pulled up the location data from the rover to give me an idea of where this shriek had come from. Near to one of the many wide craters that we had been studying to search for Martian water, I realized. The data was still being transmitted, and it told me that the final compiling would come in the morning. It was difficult to wait, but I knew that there wouldn't be many more answers coming that night. Still intrigued by the noises that I heard, I decided to pull audio files from the surrounding area for the past week and see if I could determine any clues. It resulted in a lack of sleep, and even less answers. As I pieced together the audio on my home desktop, I noticed that a pattern emerged. The screams were there every so often amid the data, but they were moving. I pulled out a map of the Martian landscape and began to chart a course where I'd heard them. As the rover moved and surveyed the area, the noise would sound as though it was following the river. Was there a possibility something was alive on the Martian world and watching our rover? The painful and anguished screams haunted my dreams. It sounded worse and worse with each new recording I found. 
Hearing the silence and the low thrumming soil of the Mars in between the unexpected shrieks was a blessing. My tired brain told me that there was more to it, but I had to sleep. And of course, nightmares came when I did. I saw cities that didn't have shape. Metropolitan areas on Mars from ancient times. It reminded me of the old science fiction stories from the 20s. An entire civilization living under the ice. In the dream, something crashed on the surface of the planet. Something from a world unlike anything we had ever encountered. The dream didn't offer it any shape or form. It was just this abomination of noise that was surrounding the entire landscape. The Martians ran in shrieked, the formless creature mimicking their suffering and spreading its awful noise everywhere. The ground shook and swallowed them all up, leaving behind only vibrations. I woke the next day in a cold sweat. It felt like that same noise had permeated my skin. I wanted so desperately to find out what was happening on the red planet. So I got to work and immediately checked the other rovers to see if they had picked up mysterious signals. I wanted my dream to be nothing more than my fragile imagination. But as I reviewed the traces of data that we had collected, I saw disturbing evidence of something within the soil where the rover had surveyed. Microorganisms. Bacterial life that can exist anywhere in the universe. It was migrating through the ground and following the rover. I began to check other data. Photographs and videos from the area that had been downloaded and properly cleaned. Yet I found nothing. No evidence of a life form near to the area. Or at least not one visible. As much as I hated to do it, I decided to present the data to my manager. I figured they could keep things under control and perhaps alleviate some of the worry that I had. These screams were troubling me, making me lose sleep and I wanted to find a scientific solution that wouldn't terrify me. She promised to review the data but the next day when I asked about it, she acted like I had made the whole thing up. That has already been processed and cataloged. I want you to focus on the other findings from the crater, she had insisted. When I returned to my research though, I found copies of the audio files on my computer, which confirmed that I had truly heard these noises. So why was she denying their existence? I tried to move them offline again to have someone outside of our facility review the data, but I soon found that the information was now heavily secured. Someone didn't want this to get out. My close friend, Stephen, told me. I showed him the chart of the Martian landscape that I had been reviewing and he began to trace a pattern from where the different noises had come from. And each time you said that, it's a high-pitched noise, he asked. I nodded and he told me something that should have been plainly obvious. This thing is getting closer and closer. Each time you record it, the pitch is decreasing. The wavelengths are traveling to you slower and slower as well. In other words, something may have gone terribly wrong on the surface of Mars and... We don't even know about it yet. Do you believe it could be something dangerous? I asked. What have these samples shown? I reviewed them again. The sudden findings of life that I had recorded were now gone. Erased completely. Rewinding that trace data showed a shocking result. When the noise came, the bacterial life forms would shrivel as a result. These screams were acting as a pestilence on the Martian world. The next nightmare I had was more vivid. The extraterrestrial parasite which had crashed on the planet was now infecting the ground. I saw a lush and vibrant Mars transform into the wasteland that we knew so well. The civilization that named the planet home was killed in only a matter of weeks. And then the virus ate them alive devouring every part of their body and possibly even their soul. I saw the invisible effects of these screams on the planet everywhere I looked in my dream. Scars that ran deep into the red core revealed wounds of dead soil, dangerous invisible parasites that eagerly cling to any life that passes by. Suddenly, I felt my legs slipping into the crimson soil being pulled under, dragged down to this Martian basement. 
I found myself scraping and gasping for breath as dirt and soil was spilling into my throat and I was drowning on this alien world. I woke up gasping and unable to breathe and I ran to the bathroom and began to vomit. What came out of my lungs were particles of sand and red soil. I looked down at my body astonished to find that I was covered in the color of Mars from head to toe. Swiftly, I bathed and shook away the nightmare, disturbed by the sudden telepathic connection I had with the planet. Was it because of the infectious noise that I had heard? Was it trying to eat me alive the same way it had the old Martians? I tried again to tell my supervisors of the potential threat, but instead of listening, she informed me that I was going to be relocated to a different department. There was evidence that you attempted to retrieve a secured audio files recently and to share them which goes against our policy. You're lucky you have a job at all, she told me. I was astounded at the sudden change in attitude. Her behavior is seemingly hostile when I brought up the recordings. I'll have the rest of the team review them, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to clear out of your desk and leave by the end of the day. I did as I was told but not before I created a small backdoor program to get into their network. It didn't take long, and I was certain that monitoring the noises would be smart for the future. Once we were finished, I left for lunch and started to download the files to my own laptop. Steven assisted me with it, but told me that most of the files were now seemed to be corrupted. I think your bosses are doing this on purpose, he said. I think it might be that this noise is affecting them subconsciously. I admitted as I fidgeted nervously with my fork. Have you tried to play the audio backwards? He asked casually. And the thought hadn't even occurred to me. Are you saying it'll be like a secret code or something? I joked. No, but it could reveal something about these samples that were missing, he told me. As we experimented with the corrupted audio again, I heard distortions and shrieks again and he immediately became tense. Jesus, that's a nightmare, he had whispered nervously. His hair was standing up on his arm as we kept listening and I commented. It gets louder every time the rover is obtaining samples. And these samples that are transmitting data here, transferring whatever this is to Earth, he asked. Neither of us knew what to make of that implication, but he requested to review the data and try to hack it that evening, so I let him. I called my boss that evening, begging her to listen to reason. Something about all of this was very wrong. You need to step out of the way of progress. These samples will show us how the entire planet of Mars has evolved into the Eden it is today. And Eden? Are we talking about the same planet? I asked with a soft laugh, but she didn't appreciate the joke. Her tone was serious. What the planet is offering to our world is greater than anything you can imagine. Terraforming an entire planet into a perfect environment. It would be a miracle for Earth, she whispered. I found myself suddenly uneasy talking to her. But the planet of Mars is dead. We've seen that it's deteriorating, perhaps even dying. How is that a blessing for us? I asked. The silence and the next moments were ominous. Death is the only consistency in the universe. Life sprung from nothing eons ago. It's inevitable that one day, it will all be snuffed out. Our time here is for one purpose alone. To serve as fuel for the next cycle. What? What are you talking about? And then I heard this low thrill behind her as she kept speaking. It's our every existence that is the problem. Life is meant only to feed death. And death, that's eternal. Perfect, beautiful. Michelle, do you hear that? I whispered, becoming terrified by the conversation. She sounded possessed. It sounded like the winds of Mars were bristling through her lungs. It is a warning of the future we must prepare for. The inevitable transformation of our own world. My mouth felt dry. These samples that have been taken from the craters... What exactly happened to them? I asked. Oh, I think you know the answer to that. They come here. 
They will find their way to our world one way or another, she whispered. The noise in the background was making my ears feel like they were bleeding. Surrender to evolution. Death is the ultimate phase of life. I hung up the phone and frantically called Steven, hoping that he was available. Yet I got no answer. I grabbed my keys and decided to race to his house. These recordings were more than just a peculiarity. They were a threat to our world. I tried to knock on his door, but there was no response. I shouted for his attention, yet instead, I heard the same shrill noise. It made me want to cover my ears and get into a fetal position. I pulled myself up and found a window that I could crawl into. Inside a small one-bedroom house, the noise was deafening. My eardrums felt like they could burst as I stuffed wads of paper to soften the intense screaming. And then I found Stephen in pieces in his living room. And it was clear the injuries were self-inflicted. He had taken one of his kitchen knives and taken off his ears first, stuffed them into his mouth, and then he went at his wrists and let it all drain out on his couch. Finally, even as his life ebbed away, it appeared that he had taken a chunk out of his stomach, letting it all hang out and dangle on the carpet. Somehow, despite all of this madness, I saw that my friend had typed a message on his laptop. A warning. They are listening. I found myself wanting to pick up that same blade and harm myself too. This invisible voice was urging me to do it. To let death take over my body. The blade touched my own neck. Digging into it as I struggled to escape the screaming. I managed to get out before I was overwhelmed by that desire. As I drove home, my boss called me again and I panicked and sent it to voicemail. When I later checked the recording, all I heard was more of the same howling. Slow, methodical, shrill noises that told me the strange, invisible threat I had heard was now here. I made it home, hardly able to think straight or even focus, and then I managed to compose this wanting for others. I have realized that the concerns Stephen had were even more serious than we first understood. The dangerous, invisible evil is already on its way here. And worst of all, we may already be too late to stop it. My grandpa fought in the Emu Wars. He finally shared his most horrible story from war. Written by Sugar Sewed. My grandfather was one of the sweetest men that ever lived. He would always have a big smile on his face and everyone loved him. I've only seen him angry one time in my life and it actually scared me to see him like that. I had discovered a story about something called the Emu Wars, where soldiers were used to hunt down emus, and I was laughing about how ridiculous it sounded. My grandfather started screaming at me, and telling me not to talk about something that I knew nothing about. He stormed out of the house while I stood there, shaking in fear. A couple of days later, he returned to our house to apologize for screaming at me. He could see the confusion on my face and I could tell how terrible he felt. I apologized for making fun of the emu wars and I just thought that it was funny. He told me to sit down as he wanted to share his experiences with me. I sat down and waited as he began to tell his tale. I had joined the military when I was 18, as I had been living with an abusive father and this seemed like the perfect way to get out. I completed basic training and was assigned to a base. There was very little to do on a daily basis, so we were constantly just training and having fun. Our base commander was an older soldier who didn't care about what happened, as long as no one did anything stupid. One morning, we were all called out for an assembly, and we were all quite excited as we hoped that we might get some action. You could see the evident disappointment on everyone's faces, as we were told that we were being mobilized to deal with a herd of emus. They were causing trouble for farmers, and we were being sent to call them. 
We were told to be ready at 12 for the next morning. Everyone was giddy the next morning as it seemed like a fun excursion. There were about 325 of us loaded into trucks as we headed out. It was a long, tedious journey, and the mood quickly darkened as the heat slowly wore down everyone's mood. There was very little to look at in any direction with only the occasional house. We finally stopped after almost an 8 hour journey, and I could see the relief on the other guys faces as we jumped off the tracks. My legs were aching from not moving for so long and I had to stretch for a minute to get some feeling back in them. We were in a remote location with nothing to see in any direction. Our base commander approached us and explained that a herd of emus was seen about 10 miles from here and that we would need to walk to get there as the terrain was very bad. He left about 50 of us back with the trucks while the rest of us marched along. We finally reached the summit off a steep hill and gazed down to see about 250 emus on the far side. The commander ordered us to set up our weapons, and we all set up and waited the order to fire. I was a very good shooter and I lined up my rifle on one of the closest birds. The sound was deafening as we all opened fire. I watched as my bullet destroyed half the face of the bird that I had been aiming at. Their gaze all turned on us and seemed to be challenging us. The bird that I had shot seemed to be glaring at me with its one good eye. A few of the other soldiers took a few steps backwards as the stares from the birds made them feel uncomfortable. The commander ordered for us to fire again and stop being such cowards. I once again targeted the same bird, and much in amazement as it somehow dodged the bullet at the last possible moment. Somehow with all the bullets we fired, only ten or so of the animals lay on the ground. I could see the hatred in their eyes as they gazed up at us. The commander was giving the order to fire another round, when the animals suddenly took off running in at the opposite direction. We stood there for a few moments watching them disappear off into the horizon. We were finally ordered to pack up our stuff as it was starting to get dark. We marched back in a disorderly fashion and were constantly on our guard as we could hear running feet on all sides of us. The emus kept appearing in small groups for a few moments before running away after we opened fire. I could hear the fear in the commander's voice as he ordered us to stop firing as we were just wasting bullets. We kept stopping for breaks as the rest of the company were scared and needed to go to the toilet all the time. It was almost pitch black when we arrived back to the trucks and we were met by scenes of carnage. The bodies of these soldiers that were left behind were strewn about the site with their insides ripped out. The trucks had been savagely attacked as there were evident scrapes and dents on all of them. Whatever had attacked them had taken them completely by surprise, as many of them didn't have guns in their hands. We were all standing there frozen in terror when one of the emus walked out of the shadows and began plucking out an eye from one of their bodies. I raised my gun to shoot it, but it ran off before I got the shot off. We all stood there not speaking for a few moments until the commander ordered us to set up a defensive ring and drag the bodies out of the way. Everyone began rushing around in pandemonium as we were just so freaked out. It took us almost an hour to move the bodies and then set up a defense around the trucks. I don't think any of us got much sleep that night as we were all on edge. I was awoken the next morning by panicked voices. I pushed myself off the rough ground and walked over to see what was going on. I listened to the conversation to discover that all the bodies were missing, as something had dragged them all off when we weren't paying attention. The commander told us to stop panicking and jumped into the truck so we could get the heck out of there. We rushed to gather up our supplies and we jumped into the back of the trucks. There was a sense of relief on people's faces as we knew that we were finally getting away from this godforsaken place. The relief was short-lived though, as none of the trucks would start. The damage that had been inflicted on them had rendered them useless. 
We stood around deciding what to do when a scream made us all spin around. My mouth hung agape as I gazed at the thousands of emus that had somehow snuck up on us and now surrounded us on all sides. We all began to back up against each other in a vain attempt to get away from them. I recognized the bird that I had shot earlier as it stood front and center amongst the others. Its face had been crippled by my bullet and its eyes seemed to be glowing. It turned around and all the other birds followed its lead. None of us had even thought to raise our guns as we were so terrified. It took a few minutes for everyone to relax as we were all still huddled together. The commander grabbed a map and discovered the nearest town was about a six days walk from here. Most of our food supplies had been destroyed, so we were ordered to grab anything that was salvageable and prepare to march. It took a lot longer to get ready than usual as people were fighting over food and water. It almost resulted in fistfights, but the commander managed to calm everyone down by pointing out that we had bigger concerns. We eventually started marching in a very complex fashion, as we were all trying to use others as cover in case of another attack. We were constantly being hounded by the emus, as they would suddenly appear in the distance before quickly disappearing from sight. We were all constantly on edge as we had never seen anything like it. We had probably been marching for three hours when the attack began. They just came out of nowhere and there were hundreds of them. I watched as one of them knocked the person beside me to the ground and then used its claws to rip his throat out. The attack was so sudden that many of us hadn't even had a chance to reach for our guns. I had managed to grab mine and I killed the closest emu to me. I was about to fire on another bird, but they all suddenly fled. We lost another 40 soldiers in this attack. My one confirmed takedown was the only one. There were a few injuries, but nothing severe, so we continued to march after grabbing supplies from the corpses. Everyone walked along with their weapons ready in case of another attack. It slowly began to dawn on us that none of us might make it out of here alive. We set up a camp that night with 25 guards on rotating shafts. I had the first shift and I could hear noises in the distance as they seemed to be circling us. I laid down on the ground after my shift and I fell asleep instantly due to the exhaustion. I was awoken by screams all around us and the sound of rushing feet. I grabbed my gun to discover the emus were launching hit and run attacks on us. I heard a noise behind me and spun around and I fired my gun. I watched in horror as I looked at the commander's face and noticed the red pouring out from the wound in his throat. He collapsed to the ground while these screams of agony and fear surrounded me. The next morning, we discovered that we had lost another 57 men, five of them from friendly fire, and I was thankful that no one had realized I was responsible for taking out the commander. We began to march, but it was obvious that many of us had already given up. The next few days were chaotic as we were being attacked every few minutes. There were less than 15 of us alive at this point, and the birds had pretty much taken out everyone that they could get close to. We had passed numerous houses as we marched, but discovered that all of the inhabitants had already been taken out by the birds. The bird that I had initially shot at the start was always watching me from the distance and I felt like he was mocking me. We were barely able to stand and I suggested that we take cover inside the next house so that we could grab some cover and rest a little bit inside. It took us about an hour to reach the next one, which was a two-story home. We quickly used what we could find in the house to try and make the house more secure. We pushed furniture in front of the windows and used wood to barricade the door shut. We were running desperately low on ammo as most of our supplies had been lost in our marge. We grabbed knives and whatever else we could find to use as alternative weapons. We all looked at each other with a look of defeat as we all knew this was going to be our last stand. We set ourselves up in different positions around the house in the hopes of holding out for as long as possible. We knew that we didn't stand a chance against these demonic creatures, as they seemed hell-bent on wiping us out. 
the hammering at the outside of the building that started just after it got dark. It was coming from all sides as the emus tried to force a way in. I heard the sounds of a sporadic gunfire from upstairs as they fired down on top of them. It took less than an hour for them to get inside. We tried to use a choke point to funnel them so that we could take them out, but unfortunately, this only worked for a minute or two as they breached the house from multiple locations. I was forced to retreat up the stairs and watched as they took out everyone on the bottom floor. I locked myself in a bedroom and knew that I was probably going to die in here. I had lost my weapon while fleeing and now my only thing that I could use was a kitchen knife. The creatures had made their way upstairs and I could hear screams quickly being cut off in the other rooms. Everything was now deathly silent as I awaited my fate. I was in near exhaustion and I must have dozed off. I awoke the next morning to silence and wondered what had happened. I opened the door to find the house soaked with red, but devoid of any of my teammates. I made my way downstairs and walked out the front door. I froze in my steps and felt my bladder release as I gazed out the door. Thousands of emus stood outside and they all gazed at me. The emu that I had shot stood at the very front, and he seemed to be smiling with what was left of his face. They suddenly all moved and a small gap opened up in between the ranks. I cautiously moved forward, as I feared they intended to just surround and find the enemy. After I made it through, they suddenly ran off in the other direction. It took me another two days to finally reach someone living, and it took me another week to get back to my base. No one would believe me at first, and a number of high-ranking officers arrived as they wanted to know how many soldiers could just disappear. They organized another mission with over a thousand heavily armed soldiers. They brought spare trucks to hopefully rescue any other survivors. I kept getting weird looks from the other soldiers as they thought that I was somehow responsible for all of this. They stopped looking at me like this as we started passing the locations where we had been attacked. We eventually reached the trucks that we had originally used and were shot to discover the bodies of these soldiers that had accompanied me. The officers looked bewildered as they didn't know how to react to this sight. They all stood there with their mouths hanging agape as the hordes of emus surrounded us again. They were soaked in blood and seemed to be challenging us. The officers quickly began issuing orders and these soldiers began to gather up the remains and load them into the trucks. We left the site as quickly as we possibly could while the emus watched from a distance. The military made up a bunch of BS to cover up what happened and paid off these soldiers' families. I was then forced out of the army and threatened with prison if I ever said anything to anyone. I gazed at my grandfather in shock as he sat there weeping. He made me swear that I wouldn't say a word of this while he was still alive. I kept my promise as he passed away a few years ago, and I finally decided to share his tale. Be careful of emus, as there is something not quite right about them. There's something evil in the forests of Illinois. They look like trees. Written by Young Seti. My plan for that day had been simple. Relaxing even. It was my first outing since the lockdown had eased. And I was nearly bursting at the seams to get out of my small apartment and back into the world. I had planned to take my regular weekend trip through one of these states and many parks, clearing my mind of the baggage accumulated over a week of working remotely for my phone bank, a job I hated, but I kept out of absolute necessity. That day now lives on in personal infamy, as the day in which the trajectory of my life was changed by the veil being lifted from over my eyes. Being exposed to the true horrors that call our world their stomping grounds. 
It was Saturday, one of the two days allotted by the work week for me to actually try and enjoy my life. The goal was to go for my usual hike, taking the two and a half hour drive from my cramped Chicago apartment out to my favorite of these states, lesser known state parks, and disappear down my favorite of its all but unused hiking trails, as was customary, taking photos of whatever interesting wildlife or flora I saw along the way. My weekend escapades into some of the various forests of my state were always about escapism. There were the few moments that I could steal for myself in which I could escape the gray fog of blandness that seemed so pervasive in my life since college days, worsened by the ever suffocating realization that I was working a dead end job in a field that I hated, in a city I didn't love and a life of pure stagnation that I was growing more and more dissatisfied of by camping or hiking and giving me a feeling of purpose my life seemed to lack. My chosen trail was the most daunting of them all, a hike stretching several miles through some of the more uneven parts of the terrain, leading across a small bridge over a creek, through some rather dense forest on rather uneven ground. Due to the difficulty of it, it was almost always empty, save for the odd occasional hiker, as dedicated as myself, or a park ranger roaming that little of a path existed amongst the ever-encroaching plant life, and even those were rare sights. When I had arrived that day, however, I was greeted at the opening of the path by red tape, stretched between hand rolls on either side of the small wooden entrance to the trail. A small sign hung from the center of it, its red letters immediately catching my eye. Trail closed due to wildfire damages. Thank you for your patience. Park service. For a moment, I considered the warning. A quick glance around me revealed only a few straggling hikers, none of whom were paying me any mind, and no sign of any park rangers. I've gone off the path before. I can wade through that creek, no problem, I thought. A tingle of excitement buzzing through me at the prospect of a hike with an added element of stealth. I had always been something of a thrill seeker, an aspect of life I really got to indulge in, stuck in a cubicle most hours of my life. And I couldn't pass up the chance to do something that got my heart racing, even as small as this. A grin stretched across my face, and I quickly made my way under the tape and down the path before anyone could take notice. The path was almost unchanged from usual, with the exception of an hour in as I approached the familiar clearing, a small man-made field of nothing maybe 20 feet across surrounded by the oaks and pines. In it stood a massive white tower like a cabin on stilts the fire lookout station. The path stretched directly through the clearing, and in view of any potential ranger on the lookout, who would surely turn me back. I crouched low, holding the straps of my camera bag close to my body to prevent it from shuffling against the leaves, venturing off the path for the first time, staying well within the tree line, as I slowly made my way around the clearing. Through the trees, I could sort of make out the ranger in the tower above, and her attention seemed to be directed the other way. I felt a small surge of relief at that. My hair stood on end in the excruciating silence. I doubt that I even took in a lungful of air until I was long past the clearing and back on the main path. Still, I kept my guard up. Based on what the notice had said, there had been a fire in the area recently, and I could imagine there may be an increase of rangers on foot in the area to identify the cause. It was strange to me, though, that I had heard nothing at all about such an event, given how much I frequented the park, and I gathered that it must have been recent. I reached the bridge soon after, or its remnants anyway, just a few acres past the tower, 
bearing the first visual evidence of any forest fire I'd seen since I'd entered. Charred remnants of the planks that had once been a bridge extended out from the earth in jagged pieces from both sides of the creek's bank. A few heavier chunks in no better shape caught on stones in the rushing water below. The fire had clearly ravaged the thing, leaving little trace of it, and I could understand why this could be seen as a potential hazard. A sudden inkling of curiosity raised a question as I looked at the area around the former bridge. None of the nearby trees seemed to bear any signs of a fire. No charring or missing leaves, and nothing. I wondered what kind of wildfire this was, and how it had seemingly leaped past half of them directly to the bridge. When, perhaps, a traveling spark. The explanations felt wanting, but the thought was a vague curiosity in itself, and not nearly enough to stop my hike. If anything, it was starting to feel something like an adventure, which is exactly what I had sort of wanted from these things. My smile returned as I began removing my boots and hiking socks, rolling up my pant legs as I stepped into the creek below. The water was colder than I had anticipated, sending an icy jolt through me as soon as I made contact. It reached just above my knees, and the current was stronger than I had expected, nearly making me lose balance, and almost plunged my back into the water. A sigh of relief escaped my lips as I maintained my footing, just barely, and crossed the stream with care, easing over these slick rocks beneath my feet. I put everything back on and continued the hike. At some point, removing my camera from the bag and snapping pictures of the places where the afternoon sun broke through the canopy. I had been walking for a little over an hour when I caught sight of what I realized was the first animal that I had seen since I had arrived. A deer, a buck specifically, with a crown of white horns that stretched magnificently. I could almost see the shot lined up in my head. I fumbled with the strap of the bag, bringing it around to my chest as I took out my camera and lined up the shot, peering into the viewfinder. Darkness. Ah, the freaking lens cap, you idiot. I scoffed before I could realize it. The animal and I both looked up at each other in that instant. Please don't. It was off before I could even finish the thought, darting deeper into the brush, down a decline in the uneven earth. I followed as best as I could, walking an impossible tightrope between staying close enough to keep it in sight and staying somewhat quiet, often failing at both. It settled down several yards ahead for a moment, taking a moment to sniff the air, before disappearing down a steep decline in the hilly surface, behind a mass of bushes, salted with an odd dust. I took the moment to catch my breath, placing my hands on my knees to keep myself up as I huffed deep breaths. Standing still for the first time since I had gotten past the remnants of the bridge, I could see the signs of the fire that had closed the path. The ground was layered in a thin film of gray ash, like a light snowfall, that covered everything in a light dusting. Beneath it, the forest floor was covered in leaves, all burnt to various degree, some in unrecognizable black crisp. Others just singed at the edges, all crumbling with contact. And there was something else. I squinted, confusion and a disgusted interest blooming in some synapses of my brain as I noticed it. It was a wet, shiny film covering parts of the ground, ash and burnt leaves sticking to it. I had almost missed it. The strange layer of whatever it was blending in with the charred leaves, black ash and making its color murky. Its consistency was snot-like and I shuddered, the mental comparison making me itch with revulsion, yet peeking an almost childlike sort of curiosity. Scanning the ground for a big twig, I noticed several more piles of the stuff, a few spots of the goo not yet dyed by the surrounding ash, 
being blown across the floor by each passing breeze. They were almost opaque, with the slightest red tint. A sudden yowl, animalistic and pained, rang out from the brush ahead, making my stomach drop, as if it were on a roller coaster. My heart seized with an immediate grip of panic, shock rippling through me in uncomfortable waves. As the final echoes of the cry rang out, a suffocating silence fell. The air grew thick with a fog of unease, that spine-tingling cry ringing in my ears. I had been hunting once and only once as a kid. My father had shot a deer, but it was moving so he hadn't landed a killing blow. The bullet dug into its hind leg, and it fell and it snapped the thing. And that poor animal, I swear it screamed, not just to bray like I had heard animals do when they were upset or scared, but screamed the type of scream of something in true agony. Dad had quickly put it out of its misery, but that scream, I'll never forget it, and this was too similar to that. Strands of creeping dread started to drape themselves over me like a tattered cloak, as these sounds brought me back to that moment. Another cry stirred me from my memory, my thoughts coming somewhat frantically. The notice had warned of downed trees and other hazards, and perhaps the animal had fallen victim to one of the above. My mind conjured an image of the beautiful thing, its leg partially impaled on some jutting piece of broken wood, as it cried desperately for help that wouldn't come. Perhaps my thinking was clouded by an old trauma, logic failing me at the moment, but I felt an unshakable urge to help the creature. How I would be able to help a 200 pound plus creature deep on a closed trail I wasn't meant to be on, I hadn't yet determined. But emotion drove my actions. I ran my mind across a small list of predators one might encounter in an Illinois forest, and though none seemed likely, I wasn't going to take a chance. I rifled through the camera bag for a few tense moments until I found what I was looking for. In the neighboring pocket to the one holding my emergency flare gun, with two flares tucked in alongside it, was a cheap revolver. I had bought it a few years before after a scary run-in with a mountain lion in another park, and I carried it for the sole purpose of scaring off something big. I felt a modicum of comfort as I gripped the handle. Adjusting my pants, I stuck it firmly between my waistband, confident that in the off chance a ranger or anyone else was this far out, to quell fears of concealed carry violations. I tried to swallow the lump of anxiety in my throat, stealing myself as I slid down the slight decline where the animal had disappeared through the tree line of some sort of a mass of old oaks. So, this is where it started. As I stepped through, it was as though I had stepped into another world, entering a clearing that bore every potential scar of a wildfire. It was one of ash and waste, the ground littered with the few burned stumps of the trees that had once stood, sooty ash traveling on the breeze, sticking to the sweat on my brow. Save for the few standing twists of bark jarred a pale white, and the skeletal shapes of trees barren of their leaves and branches, the last stubborn remnants of some of the regal oaks that had once stood there, it appeared all but desolate until I saw it. At the dead center of this surreal little wasteland hidden with the trees, stood the only tree that seemed relatively unharmed, somehow by the destruction that had been wrought. Something vague and ominous tangled in me at the sight of it, dwarfed by the overwhelming curiosity of the unusual thing arose. It stood, all but touched by the blaze that had laid waste to the forest around it. From where I stood, it looked almost like an unusually large birch tree, its bark a pale with what looked like dark knots along its surface, a shock of brilliant red leaves extending from the top of it. As I drew closer, my eyes roaming its shape I saw, peeking from behind at the bottom of its trunk, two hooved back legs. 
The embers of unease were fanned, blazing a bit hotter, as I realized I had found what I was looking for. The deer, that regal thing I intended to capture in all its glory, it was almost surely dead, if not asleep, and I very much doubted that by its stillness. Laying with its upper half concealed behind the wide trunk of the odd tree, and the way that its legs splayed out unnaturally. I considered turning back, the thought weighing heavier on my mind with the growing unease. When else am I going to see something like this? This is why you came here, to be out of your comfort zone. The thought was almost a realization, but I knew that it was true. There was no way that I was turning back yet. Curiosity burned every bit as bright as my discomfort, perhaps brighter as I grew nearer, and saw the odd shuffle of the strange tree leaves. The scene was almost beautiful in a morbid way. The deer lay partially concealed behind the soot-layered white tree in a land of waste, as ash carried on the breeze like snow. The tree itself, I realized, was just as haunting in its own regard and against my better judgment, I approached. Alone it stood at the center of the clearing, burned into the forest like a scar. Amongst nothing but ash and gnarled remains of others it stood. The longer that I looked at it, the more I could feel an animal dread clawing at the recesses of my mind, which I dismissed as a natural instinct of being in an area following such ruin. As I approached, any semblance of beauty faded as it was brought into resolve. I'm no arborist or whatever, and I never claim to be some expert in plants, but I've seen my fair share of trees and could identify near any native to the area. And this thing was different. It looked vaguely like an oak. Now that I was within a yard or two of it, yet its bark seemed strange, almost dead somehow. It bloated out as though whatever grew inside wouldn't fit the bark for much longer, distending outwards at unusual angles. Its color was more gray than the usual tone of brown, and little flecks of burnt wood flaked and peeled off, all over it leaving something resembling a ring of ash at its base. The knots bulging out from it at points were all spherical in shape, with deep gouges down the center of them. It made my skin crawl with an insectoid sensation. The urge to see each of them off, raising the hair along my back, until I got a closer look at the top of the thing. Jesus Christ. I breathed as I took a closer look at the tree's strange foliage. The leaves, if I could even call them that, were unlike any I had ever seen. There were less leaves by any recognizable metric, and more like clear sacks of reddish liquid, each in a teardrop shape that, at a distance, made them appear to be red leaves. As I drew closer, I couldn't tell what they were. They pulsated barely, but it was noticeable the longer that I looked. They filled and emptied with each quiver, cycling more of that liquid through with each pump. It was like thousands of little malformed hearts lining the branches of the thing pumping in unison. My skin crawled and contracted with primal disgust, as though insects were crawling the surface, everything about the unnatural sight making me sick. I need to get a picture, I thought, the deer almost gone from my mind at this point. There was something so strange, so alien and impossible about what I was seeing. The before I realized what I was doing, I had slung my camera over my shoulder and reached out, the tip of my index finger touching one of the pulsating leaves. The pace of its pulse quickened to a frantic point, the red ooze contained within its members' walls leaking through unseen pores and onto my hand. Oh, gross, I cried, yanking my hand away. A sickly sweet scent wafted forth me as though the contact had caused it. An unappealing sensation when blended with the sheer disgust I felt of the substance. My stomach turned with the palpable threat of vomit in response. 
It was warm and thick, like coagulated blood, and it started to burn increasingly the longer that it sat. I wiped my hand against my pant leg vigorously, managing to get most of the red liquid off, though it left a stain on my palm. My mind drew a blank for anything even vaguely similar. From some murky depths of my consciousness, something cried for me to get as far away as I could from the thing, an inexplicable dread rising in me at the sight of the thing. Yet even more pronounced was the curiosity I felt surging, and the enticement of the prospect that I had discovered as something unheard of outweighing the surreality of the situation. This tree was utterly unlike any plant that I had ever seen, seeming to possess features that I had only known to exist in animals, and my mind began to run wild with images of my name in journals and massive paydays for the first photographic evidence of an unknown type of life, and leaving behind the cubicle life. As if by the flip of a switch as I stood there, I recalled the very reason I had entered the clearing, the deer. I had wanted to get a good look at it, a morbid curiosity as to why it seemed to just drop dead pushing me forward. I rounded the tree, the legs coming more and more into view from around the other side as I did. The bark seemed to radiate with an odd heat from somewhere within, reminiscent of the warm emitted from another person's body when you stand too close. Nausea twisted my stomach into knots and my mouth went dry. The soles of my brown hiking boot were stained a dark red amongst the clinging dirt. A swell of panic began to arise, my mind beginning to reel up possibility after possibility for why or how it could have ended up like that in so little time. Knowing that no animal that was native to this part of the country was possible of that sort of destruction. I rounded the tree. Dueling confusion and dread both blooming in me as I realized I had been wrong, or half wrong at least. The deer hadn't simply been laying behind the tree, not all of it at least. It was certainly dead, though what lay before me in a dark pool of scarlet blood was only the lower half of its body. Anything above the center of its chest was torn away. I kept my head docked doing what I could to avoid my head at touching one of those sticky leaves as I stared at it. Curiosity and the strange surreality of the situation freezing me in place, my mind beginning to flood with questions, chief among them being, where was the second half of the deer? My mind reeled for an answer. I had only seen it mere minutes ago into my understanding. Even a mountain lion couldn't do so much damage in so little time let alone disappear without a trace. I was beginning to question why I had ventured this far. The lighthearted hopes of an adventure from earlier, all but gone with the realization that I may have knowingly brought myself near whatever predator was capable of this. The stark silence in the clearing began to feel dark and foreboding, when the thoughts were scattered in an instant, by the feeling of something warm and wet hitting the center of my forehead. A shock rippled off from the point of contact and I stumbled back wiping it away. Disgust took blossom out into waves, my stomach twisting at the sight of the red streak and along my hand. For a moment, I brought my hand close to my face reluctantly, expecting, almost hoping for the sweet scent of that strange sap from the leaves. I pulled back immediately once I knew there was none. It was blood. The consistency was unmistakable. I rubbed away vigorously at my forehead with the bottom of the shirt, staining it the same color, my eyes roaming up the tree in an automatic response. The blur of motion from something large and dark falling quickly from above, along with the wet rustle of those strange leaves spurred me into motion before I could process it. Crab, I cried, leaning back in time to narrowly avoid being crushed beneath it. The impact of whatever it was kicked a cloud of ash up in its wake, billowing in all directions, and I could feel an irritating itch in my throat as I breathed it in descending into a brief coughing fit. 
as the ash had cleared from the air, it revealed what had almost crushed me. Falling apparently somewhere out of the canopy of this unnerving tree was revealed. The air felt cold, colder than before, and a sense of horror bred only by a series of inexplicable events that gripped my heart, and an icy vice of panic. As I looked up at the upper half of the deer, my mind still reeling as its sudden appearance. Large puncture wounds aligned its body as though something massive had been chewing on it. Tattered flecks of muscle and tissue hanging from the point at which it had clearly been ripped in half. My mind reeled, conjuring frightful images of the animal capable of doing this. It was time to go, I realized. There was something large and predatory nearby, and I didn't want to meet it. I turned to leave, giving a parting look at that impossible tree, its pale, strange bark, and those pulsating cell-like leaves, as I climbed the little small incline out of the ashen clearing. I had begun to walk back, but with every step, the nagging instinct to return for just a moment grew. It was as if my camera burned hot in my hand, begging me to go back and take just one photo of that thing. Ah, I forgot the picture. I came all this way for nothing at this point, I thought. And you'll never see anything like this again, probably. Just one picture. My pace slowed, and eventually, with a sigh, I came to a stop. Freaking idiot, I muttered. Just one picture from a distance, and then I'm out. And I repeated it under my breath as if it were a mantra. My eyes on my camera as I proceeded back towards the edge of the area scarred by the apparent fire, getting my settings in order. I arrived at the precipice of the little drop-in, and giving my camera a final once-over to ensure the process was a quick and smooth, I slid down into the clearing. I landed with the firm crunch of dead or dying leaves under my feet, and, closing my other eye, lined up the eerie tree in my viewfinder. Through the haunting shapes and making up the forest, charred remnants surrounding it, seeing it for the first time since I had turned back. Crunch. An animalistic crunch rang out. My heart went into freefall. The clearing echoed with a stomach churning series of sounds like the sloppy chewing of a massive animal, making my blood run cold. Dread washed over me like a waterfall as I saw through my camera something I couldn't understand. Somehow both halves of the deer hung several feet from the ground, tangled in the pale limbs of the tree, which seemed to have wrapped one or more of their legs in a vice grab, as if it had grown around them. At first it appeared that the tree was covered in insects, or small worms lashing out at the corpse until I realized what I was seeing and it was somehow worse. The feeling quickly faded into a sense of a stomach-twisting horror, the likes of which I had never known before, at the utter alien impossibility of what I was looking at. Those leaves. I don't even know if I can call them that. They were like parasites, small rope-like growths shooting in and out of them, latching onto the animal's remains and going from pale to red as they filled with its blood. I watched, awash in a paralyzing blend of odd horror and disgust, as they thrashed at and fought with one another in their attempts to feed, extensions gliding blindly into the corpse. They would sometimes entangle each other by accident in the frenzy, leading to a thrashing conflict ending only when one seemed to tear the other from its leave which would grow another and continue the horrific feeding. It was frantic, unearthly, and I could feel my sanity shift under the weight of it all. Suddenly, as though receiving some collective instruction, the leaves curled away, withdrawing their strange grows. In that same instance, the branch of the tree began to coil and tighten, resembling less the appendage of any sort of tree and more the torso of a snake or some ungodly tentacle. The branch of the tree raised, with a slow creak that filled the air, as its bark tilted back. Those reaching leaves lowered close to the ground. That hole which I had rightfully assumed the deer had been impaled in, though I had not anticipated how, opened wider, 
and I understood immediately what it was, as it squeezed remnants of blood and viscera from the poor beast's lower half, like a child would a juice box. It lowered the rest of the animal into its mouth, gnashing violently on its bony lower half. The crunching continued, the sound horrid and muffled from within the bark of whatever the heck this thing was, and its branch-like limbs lowered to its sides, the bark rippling and folding with motion like the head of a lizard as it devoured its mouthful. Fear sent a spasm through my body. I tensed, my fingers twitched. Beep. Click. My camera gives off its electronic chime, followed by the click of the lens as it takes a photo. Searing panic grips my heart and device until it feels as though I may pass out. Everything in me yearned to run, to get as far from whatever impossibility I was seeing. My thoughts sporadic and non-linear under the sheer amount of panic that I felt. But for a few moments, my body remained frozen, terror robbing me of my faculties. For several seconds, there was nothing. The noisy chewing from the thing in the center of the clearing is stopping abruptly. But the whisper of the breeze among the surrounding leaves and the echoed click of the camera. The tension in the air was suffocating, and I stepped back against the mound of earth at my back. Malevolent energy palpable in waves from the monstrous thing standing just a few yards ahead of me. I watched through the lens, afraid to even move my hand from my face. Every second of stillness watered both hope and a swelling horror in opposition. The groan of creaking wood carried through these silent woods with ominous effect. The stir of the thing's leaves were the first sign of its movement. The entire thing moved, its massive form turning in place. I immediately understood why there had been such odd details on the thing, and the strange sense of pareidolia I felt while looking at it that I couldn't quite pinpoint. I could see now that several of these strange knots and lines throughout had simply been shot, concealing behind them the true nature of whatever was inside of the bark. The lines that had seemed almost carved into the warped wood revealed rows of small and jagged teeth like the jaws of a lamprey. The knots in the bark were apparently eyelids, dozens of them, sprouting forth all over the strange creature. Beneath them sat dozens of little piercing yellow eyes like those of a snake, and all of them were directed at me. A cold dagger of dread seared through me. Crap. The thought summed up all I felt succinctly. My thoughts instantly awash a sort of dread that I had never known and a familiar irritation at my error, this time with surely dire consequences. It reared back, the hole that could have only been its mouth stretching open to give a momentary glimpse at something dark and wet looking beneath, before another mouth opened, this one lined with rows of small teeth that weren't made of wood. A sound like the wail of an infant but from something much larger, unhinged and raw with emotion, tinged with a fury that made my skin crawl, rang from behind me, echoing off of the surrounding trees, almost making me feel surrounded. The horror rolled through me in tidal waves, adrenaline soon following, sending a warm shock through my system, kicking my heart into a painful rhythm. I turned, the hairs in the back of my neck rising as I put the thing behind me, and scurried up the little earth mountain out of the clearing, rising to my feet with more effort than I would have liked as I started to run back the way that I had come. The sound of rushing wind rang out from behind me like some miniature hurricane moved in my wake, and as I chanced to glance before the clearing disappeared behind the foliage, I saw it stretch itself along the ground and began slithering forward with all the speed and ferocity of a charging animal, slithering with surprising agility between the charred remnants of forest dotting the impromptu clearing. I ran, jumping over gulches and ducking beneath the limbs of trees as I fled down the unkempt path. The camera in its bag buckled against my back, slung over opposite shoulders, and I worried for a moment that the strap wouldn't hold before immediately dismissing the thought of how stupid it was given present circumstances. 
With every step, my legs threatened to collapse from beneath me, fearing exhaustion spreading like an infection, making my body feel heavy and unresponsive. The rush of blood roared in my ears and my head throbbed as I watched the forest floor ahead of me, desperate not to stumble over anything knowing a simple trip was the difference between life and a cliché horror movie death. I stuck to the path as best as I could, veering off at points in order to put trees between the slithering monstrosity and myself. It cried out again. Close enough behind that, I could feel the vibration of it to my bones. My heart plummeted, the sheer horror motivating a momentary burst of speed. The forest echoed with the cracking and barking breaking wood from the creature itself, and all that it trampled in its wake, the leaves on surrounding trees shaking with its approach. I made the split-second decision to chance another glance behind me. A flood of adrenaline spurred my existential dread, and it spurred me forth as I saw it. That thing, it was slithering amongst the treetops, making them creak under its weight as the trunk of its body wrapped around those of the massive oaks as it stretched from tree to tree. Its branches were merely a grasping mass of limbs, almost tentacles it seemed, sheathed in wood. It moved with an impossible speed and fluidity for something of its size. The leaves that hung to its limbs ejected their thin vestiges furiously, creating an almost pulse-like effect. It was moving too fast. There was no way that I was going to be able to outrun it. The exit from the trail was 10, 15 minutes away at least, and the thing was closing the distance between us rapidly. The cacophony behind me growing closer by the second regardless of my own speed. I'm going to die. This isn't possible and uh, I'm going to die too. I couldn't even finish the thought. Not for the horror of the realization, but... The simple fact that I hadn't had any clue what I was running from. And then I heard it. The faint trickle of running water was audible from ahead, even amongst the chaos. I felt a sudden rush of something close to help, as the charred remnants of the bridge came into view soon after. Something in me sparked at the first sight of something familiar, the bridge almost feeling like a landmark to spur me forth. Desperation surged through the passageways of my brain as an idea occurred. Before I could consider what I was doing, I drew the revolver from my waist and lined a shot as best as I could while still running. Panic coiled around my heart with every step my pace slowed as I tried to take in a breath and steady myself. I fired. I was a decent shot, nothing spectacular, but I could get a nice grouping on a target a few times I was able to get down to the range and practice. But I had never once considered actually shooting a moving target. Six thunderous bangs exploded out from the mouth of the gun as I cocked the hammer and pulled the trigger as quickly as I could, interspersed by two wet pops. Without the usual luxury of earmuffs worn at a range, my ears filled with a tinnitus-like ring. A dagger-like pain exploded in my wrist. Several of the shots hit nothing but air, as expected, disappearing through the canopy above into the sky. Yet by some stroke of uncharacteristic luck, the third and sixth shots made contact. There is the sound of cracking wood, followed by wet pops as the metal projectiles ripped through the beast splintering its makeshift wooden exoskeleton. Its tentacle limbs went limp momentarily. Surprise, somehow apparent even, in its utterly unfamiliar features. The distraction enough to make it lose its balance among the treetops it had been darting between. It was sent plummeting nearly 30 or 40 feet from the canopy, hitting the ground with a blood-curdling shriek. Projectiles of twigs, rocks, and other forests at Detritus flew out in all directions. The sound of its massive form meeting the earth, louder than the shots had been. The cursory thought that perhaps the shot from my little revolver might have dealt the horror a lethal blow was foolish. But its reaction at least confirmed to me that I could hurt the horrid thing which was a source of light amongst the seeming darkness of my predicament. It started twitching and thrashing in a way 
that was reminiscent of an insect writhing under the effects of some poison. As though the landing had done some neurological damage, the movement made even more awful by its form. Eventually, it ceased the stomach-turning, twisting, and nodding of its strange form, worm-like in a way that made my skin crawl, settling into a heavy, breathing mass of wood and whatever the sleek-like thing that lied beneath its bark was as it regained its composure. It screeched out with the sound reminiscent of a car crash, the groan of metal against metal forced by traumatic force into impossible shapes. It was inconceivable from the vocal cords of any being that I could think of yet. Somehow it sounded tinged with an obvious pain. I was sure that it must have echoed for miles. I felt my eardrum shake, my vision doing the very same. I had injured it and I was sure of that. The realization that I was even capable of such a thing gave me a brief ray of hope. Scorched almost as soon as it occurred to me that I had expended what little ammunition I had kept on me. The gun was always meant to be a last a ditch effort for scaring off an animal. And never something that I ever intended to use outside of a range. So the idea of carrying a load of ammunition besides what I kept chambered had seemed unnecessary. Now, I wanted to hit myself for my laziness, though I knew such a thing as this could never have been anticipated. Still, my two shots would clearly not be enough to stop the coiling mass of wood, as evident by the thrash of movement as it tried to bring itself to its feet, struggling visibly with the injury. It let out another, otherworldly cry tinged with a universally understood emotion. Rage. The gun was now empty, and I was again defenseless, though the pressure of terror and unparalleled still weighed on me. I had heard it, and the fact had offered me a sort of fuel to push me forward. The fire watchtower. It was as though a switch had been flipped, my mind recalling the tower which I had gone through a great effort to avoid, and the ranger that it housed. It was certain the commotion of the beast's pursuit must have been audible from that distance, and I prayed that if I could get close enough, I could call for help. I knew that the signal would be even spotty then, and doubted that I would have time to place a phone call, but surely the ranger in the watchtower would hear the chaos. What a singular park ranger might be able to do against this titan I wasn't sure, but in the heat of the moment it felt like a light at the end of the tunnel. The beast was still shaken but regaining its strength more by the second. I could see the area that my shot had hit. And though I wasn't sure what to expect, I was still surprised at the result. The wood covering its body for almost a foot around the point of impact had been shattered, like a broken exoskeleton, exposing something black and slimy underneath, spilling out of the opening. A wound in the surface of the thing within the hollow shell of bark bubbled with a dark red liquid. Several of the eyes aligning its bark all turned in me. A hazy fury present even in their alien gaze. No more time to think. I ran, not bothering to remove my boots this time as I trudged across the icy creek, clawing myself onto the opposing bank and running towards the tower. Water sloshed in my shoes and added extra weight to my clothes, which were soaked through my navel down. The crashing of movement from behind I started again as though a train were somehow moving through the center of the forest. It was up again, though I had heard it more than I thought it seemed. Its movements appeared limited, and that's a stretch of the word to the ground now. Whatever damage I had dealt enough to make the pulling its weight through the air infeasible. It now slithered on the ground as I had first seen in the clearing, pushing itself through the earth as though the dirt were liquid. It was slower now, but not by much charging along the forest floor like some massive snake, only slowing down to stretch itself across the creek. I ran like I never had before. Every muscle burned and ached. My lungs stung with each breath, and the thud of my heartbeat felt life-threatening. The threat that I was going to vomit lingered, my body undergoing a level of physical exertion I wasn't prepared for. I couldn't, though. Even a momentary break of pace would likely mean a violent end. I wasn't going to stop. 
driven forward by my most primal of survival instincts. The clearing had to be only a few minutes away if my memory had served. An idea sparked the synapses of my brain. Without another thought, I pulled the revolver again, letting off the final three shots in a flurry at the general direction of the creature. I could hear its movement shift, and with a momentary look back saw it break its straight path towards me, veering off into the trees in a blur, as the bullets sank into the bark of trees or exploded into the dirt where it had been. Good enough. It was after me, but it appeared to be circling through the trees, rather than barreling down the path like a train, making its approach less of a straight shot. I had bought some time. Trying to keep my pace, I reached into the camera bag, flying widely around my chest, pulling the flare gun out. I struggled as I ran to load the cartridge into it, my hands unsteady. But the sound of falling trees as the thing grew closer served to motivate me as I eventually got it in. For a split second, I worried about whether a flare could start another fire, having already seen the damage it could wreak on this forest. And that might be for the best. I raised the gun to the air and let off a shot. There was a pop, not nearly as loud as the revolvers and a hiss that grew ever distant as the glowing projectile took to the sky. That thing, it shrieked but the sound was a different now, almost afraid, and I heard it come to a crashing halt. I considered looking back but instantly thought better of it, unwilling to squander this opportunity to put distance between us. The path ahead was growing clearer, the signs of human intervention and upkeep growing more apparent. Familiarity bloomed in me, with it the greatest hope that I had felt since the horrific ordeal had begun. I was close. The path ahead began to curve and I knew that in just a few turns I was going to see the clearing. And then I heard it again. The booming roar of earth being displaced by something massive as it dozed to forth, closing in fast. Too fast. No, no, God, no, I begged, my legs searing from the heat of pain and exertion. I ran straight through the trees, veering off of the twisting path for fear of losing precious seconds, branches clawing and whipping deep cuts into my face as I did, my breathing loud and jagged. I screamed, with what breath I could muster, calling for help knowing that I had to be within hearing distance of anyone at the tower who would surely have seen my flare. I could see it, emerging through a break in the trees ahead of the center of the clearing, which seemed to glow with sunlight and salvation against the rumble of certain doom behind me. Hurry up, I can't help you until you're out of there. I heard the woman's voice before I saw her, but her words were all I needed to push forward. He radiated off of the massive form, growing warmer along the back of my neck as it drew closer. The hairs on my neck rising as the cloying flagella of its would-be leaves all thrashed forward, occasionally reaching far enough to sink into my neck with a sharp sensation. I slapped at them frantically, my hands coming away covered in my own blood in that mucusy fluid. The opening in the trees grew when the tower quickly came into view, and I could soon see who it was that had spoken out. She wore the usual polyester short beige button-up, and a wide brim hat usual for a park ranger, though even in my frantic state I could see the glaring peculiarities. For one, she held something large in both of her hands, a rifle I realized, as raising its massive barrel as I approached until it was pointing right at me. No, not a rifle, I realized. A flamethrower. I was almost out, just about to reach where the forest and clearing meet, when something thrashed against my back with incredible force. One of the bees, wood sheathed tentacles, I imagine now looking back, sending me diving face first into the ground. My head sang with impact, and the frantic shouts of the ranger faded into garbled background noise as I tried to gather myself, turning to face it as it closed the remaining distance. The closest of its grasping limbs snaked across the dirt of the forest floor and quickly slid up my shoe and onto my leg, attempting to wrap itself around my ankle. The bark dug into the leg of my pants and I could feel something like a muscle starting to tighten painfully beneath it. No, it was my mind's singular panic-driven declaration, a refusal of the death I was surely about to be pulled to. 
I dove forward with all the strength I could muster from the ground, my right leg being extended out by the creature as it pulled, launching all of my weight into the clearing. I managed to tear from its wanting grab, the jagged bark, ripping the leg of my jean and leaving deep scratches in my skin in the process, but my heart soared in the instant I felt my leg come free. I threw myself forward into a stumbling run, managing to collapse and roll in rolling heap at the woman's feet. Kill it! I hardly recognized the belligerent panic in my voice as I half crawled, half stumbled into a run, making a mad dash to the tower which had come to represent safety in my mind, only stopping once I was halfway through the clearing and realized that I hadn't heard the creature charging forth. The woman stood at the edge of the clearing, a weapon raised to the creature which made it stand at the very edge of the forest, as though somehow the clearing were a boundary. It rose to its full height and I felt my mind waned under its impossible form. It stretched almost thirty feet, the bark that had concealed it cracking profusely and revealing what was beneath. It looked vaguely slug-like, large and black, shining with a coat of some fluid. Its body was covered in bulging eyelids that concealed those piercing yellow eyes, long eerily human mouths full of hundreds of sharp teeth. All from its upper middle section and above stretched along dark tentacles, swaying eerily like branches in a breeze. Those pulsing leaves, now more like cells in my eyes, connected to the respective branch by thick blue veins. Yet somehow that thing, bred straight from a nightmare, was kept at bay. He and the short woman appeared to be locked in a battle of wills, and neither breaking the other's gaze. I don't know how you survived the first burning. God forbid you monsters are still breathing somehow, but you know what's got to happen next, bud. She spoke to it like she was chastising a dog that had bitten someone. Disappointment and genuine sadness in her voice. The creature hissed at her with every one of its mouths, those beady yellow eyes screwing into a look of pure hate. Despite all I had seen that day, I still found myself taken aback. The thing seemed to understand her, and the way she spoke, as if somehow familiar with the thing, a pan they already armed to deal with it. My head spun, what sort of park ranger was this? I'm sorry about the others, your parents may be, not really sure if you reproduce, but you guys can't go around eating all the animals and patrons of the park. Sorry kiddo. She pulled the trigger of the device and with a click, the beast recoiled with another hiss and a shudder of anger. For several seconds, there was nothing but the fading echo of its cry and the breeze rolling over the field. Another click and then another. Nothing. No, no, not now. The woman began cursing and muttering frantically, backing away slowly as she looked between the weapon and the creature mere feet away from her. I could see the confidence waver even in her posture, and the cold knot of dread in me swelled this time not for myself. That thing for the first time I had seen it did something familiar, human even, all the more horrific given its nightmarish visage. It smiled, a crew, joyless smile, with every one of those razor-filled mouths curling up. She ran, letting the weapon fall to the ground as she turned and sprinted towards me, yelling something that I could hardly make out through the pounding in my ears. Go, run! She cried, motioning angrily for me to flee. It was on her in seconds, the beast almost tackling her as it caught her in a tangle of its limbs, wrapping two of them around her leg. I could see the things covering the branches in a veritable feeding frenzy, their protrusions snapping in and out as they filled with little streams of blood, attaching anywhere there is exposed skin. She screamed, doing her best to slap them from her face unable to reach her legs as the creature drew her near. It rose to its feet, causing the ranger to hang upside down by her legs, alternating between fighting at the thousands of little things leeching at her face and trying to pry the vice grip of the branches around her ankles. I'm going to watch this woman die. She likely saved my life and is about to die for it. It was harrowing, almost worse than the fear that I had felt for my own life. A strange sort of guilt mixed in as though I'd exchanged her life for mine. 
I remembered the deer. The way I had found the thing completely torn like some stuffed animal. And for a moment I pictured the ranger in its place. My blood went cold at that. A loud crack made me jump as the thing slammed one of its massive limbs into the ranger, who threw up her arms in what little defense it offered. The creature crowded in rage and triumph, bringing one of its bellowing mouths within inches of her face, before repeating the act, delivering several more forceful blows. It was toying with her like I had seen my cat do with the odd mouse unlucky enough to wander inside. Several of its mouths spread into a smile that made my skin prickle. I racked my mind for something, anything that I could do to prevent what I knew was coming. Anything that I had done to her to disturb this thing before, I remembered. The woman hung there, dazed for a moment, before spitting a mouthful of blood and saliva at the nearest of its eyes. It hissed, its hackles somehow raising, rearing back and lifting her above the largest of its maws. Those jagged spikes of wood still bore the remnants of its prior kill as it held her over oblivion. It was like finding a diamond in the rough, the memory playing almost like a flashback. I grabbed the flare gun from my camera bag, loading the final flare into the chamber. You little son of a, she muttered, but it roared in response, lowering her into its mouth when, pop. The sound of the flare gun caught its attention in an instant, its body and every one of its eyes turning in my direction, mouths shutting an automatic response. It flung the woman to the ground with so much force that she bounced, but still, she managed to half crawl, half roll away as my final flare whistled through the air. Its path curved and lulled us slightly in the breeze, but stayed true to course. The creature yelped, Something that I had not yet heard from it. A sound of fear and surprise. It had been distracted. Its strange fury and wrath directed at the ranger, making it all but forget about me and occupying its senses. It lurched to the side, moving its massive body with incredible speed as it managed to mostly avoid contact. The flare soaring into its alien canopy. The minor contact was apparently enough. A ringing hiss like air rushing out of a balloon filled the clearing. Once and then twice, and then a hundred times over I saw the gelatinous sacks beginning to swell with a bubbling liquid and gas that glowed through some strange reaction. Flames darted hungrily between the blobs which expanded rapidly, glowing brighter by the second as the reaction traveling with them. Its eyes darted in all directions between the spreading fire and me, Fear and hatred glowing bright, despite the unfamiliarity of its appearance. It looked as though it wanted to charge at me, kneeling forward as if to do so, when the first of a series of explosive pops sounded from its canopy. One of these swollen masses had burst, releasing a boiling spray of the fluid from inside all around it. Some searing drops landed on neighboring leaves settling them into an explosive reaction repeating the process. The flames caught the liquid and burned white hot, following the trails of bloody fluid running down the monster's bark to spread along the sides of its body. Glowing cracks spread through the dead bark of the tree, falling away to reveal the thing beneath. It was massive, and I couldn't understand how it had fit in the bark to begin with. It appeared to be a giant slug or something similar, with slimy black tentacles, many of which were now sizzling and burning with the blaze, thrashing wildly at what might have been at the top or bottom of it. Throughout them were those swelling blobs, connected by deep purple veins that pulse as though with a heartbeat. The yellow eyes lying in its black body burned with unreadable emotion as it tried to fight the flame spreading quickly along its body. What was left of its wooden exoskeleton was completely engulfed and it seemed the mucusy liquid it was covered in beneath was flammable, as the contents of its leaves, the fire rolling along its skin with ease. The cries of protest and fury grew airy and weak, eventually dying into faint hisses as the thing started to wither and dry under the spread of the inferno. I ducked away, feeling several flecks of the boiling liquid from those sacks hit my face as several more pop with a resounding finality. 
and the monster ceased its movement, falling into a rapidly emoliating heap. It took several moments before I was willing to move. My mind unable to accept the horror was over, despite seeing it burn before me, after expecting the monster to lurch forward with a roar at any moment. But it didn't. The only sounds coming from the beast were the hisses and pops of escaping gases from the dying blaze of its utterly charred form, which seemed to shrink until it was merely a few glowing embers in a slimy puddle. I approached the ranger, who was already sitting herself up as she observed the aftermath. She winced slightly as she rose, her arms swelling from what was likely a broken bone, rushing to her side as she fell back into a sitting position. I went to help her up but was waved off as she leaned back on her good arm, taking in deep breaths. It'll take a second to catch my breath. I'll have to call this in and wait for backup anyways, which will be a while. She took a deep breath, wincing. I definitely broke a rib or three, she muttered. I'm Savannah, you can call me Sav. She raised her bad hand to shake and then, observing it rapidly swelling, I thought better of it. Hey, thanks for the help. I was impressively quick thinking under pressure. My mind was overrun with a hundred questions all piling up to be asked at once. What was that? I asked the most obvious of the questions. And why did you have a flamethrower? Well, I obviously have a flamethrower, a piece of crap. She kicked at the weapon on the ground. And because of those. She nodded her head at the smoldering pile that had been the beast. And what it is, we're not really sure. From what we can tell, it's some sort of gnarly parasite. Probably alien is my guess. Starts off really tiny, almost looks like a leech. And then it burrows its way into the center of a massive tree. It grows until it fills the thing from within, eating away at all the wood inside. And it uses the bark as something of an exoskeleton for its body, which is pretty vulnerable otherwise. Somehow it only brought up more questions. Who is we? Does the park service know about this? My mind began to put seemingly unrelated pieces of a puzzle together. Is that why the trail was closed? There was never a forest fire, was there? She sighed, lifting herself to her feet with a little bit of effort. Listen, you're full of questions and that's understandable. You were almost attacked by a giant tree monster. I'm also in excruciating pain because I was just pummeled by a tree monster. It's also understandable. So I'm going to answer the few questions you just asked, and then I'll ask you one of my own. Depending on the answer, you'll go about your day as you like, and I'll head to my post to lick my wounds until backup arrives. Cool? Uh, depending on... Uh, yeah, okay. I muttered, curiosity taking hold. She nodded. The we I referred to as my organization or group or whatever, the rangers. So the park service does know about... No interrupting, she said firmly, her eyes dark with irritation. I nodded to continue. No, they don't, or maybe they do and don't recognize it officially, I don't know. We're not the park service rangers, well. A lot of us are, but that's just because it makes the job easier. We call ourselves the rangers, and it's not just a US thing, though. We're pretty big in Canada and Mexico. We keep an eye on anywhere in nature that there are run-ins between people and the things that go bump in the night. It's our job to prevent stuff like what you just saw today from interfering in the lives of the general public. She coughed a bit, wincing and grabbing her chest at the movement. So now, the park service and the other rangers at large probably don't know. But we've got people among them that do. And once I took care of the clearing, the affected area of those things, we were able to push the forest fire angle pretty smoothly and get the path closed to keep people from venturing down this way. Even took out the bridge to make sure any stubborn fools really got the idea. She said the last two things somewhat pointedly, glaring for emphasis, and I could feel my face flush. I guess one must have survived somehow, and we must have missed it. I hope so at least, the alternative is these things are breeding somewhere. She shook her head as if not wanting to consider the thought. Now for my question. She started, staring at me with a look of interest. I take it you're an avid nature guy, probably someone who enjoys going where others wouldn't consider, given the gear and that the path you're on. 
and the fact that you took it to days despite all of our very intentional warnings not to. I nodded. Not sure how to feel, she seemed to have read me. You handled the situation relatively well, clearly. You got this far without killing you, and technically, you saved my life under pressure. I wanted to say something in argument, but couldn't think of what. She wasn't wrong, and now that the experience was over, I couldn't lie. I was feeling more alive than I could remember. Though, if she was trying to allude to all of this being some act of skill, I was strongly in disagreement. I think I'll be out of commission for a while, and you're already quite familiar with this area, I imagine. And you've experienced firsthand what I'm out here to stop. We're always looking for new people in our ranks, and there is a specific but odd type most suitable. Animal experts, nature lovers, and others have all proven useful for a variety of reasons. And something tells me that you would fit in as a ranger. She paused. We'd better get you a flamethrower, of course. She gave it another firm kick. My head spun at the invitation to a group that I had only just learned existed, and still somehow had my doubts. I had a job, but it was nothing that served as any strong motivation to say no. I scoured my brain for logical reasons to reject and found very few, besides the obvious. Would I want to experience something like this again? If I say no, and if I talk about any of this, will you guys? I didn't want to say it for fear that she would confirm. Kill you, she laughed and then winced. Literally, don't make me laugh, it hurts. No, with something like this, you honestly could walk right out of here right now and talk all you want. Not to seem all sinister, shadowy group on you, but who's going to believe someone claiming they were attacked by a tree monster and saved by a secret group of park rangers? Heck, go share your story. It might be therapeutic and scare off a few more morons from doing what you did. I opened my mouth to argue but couldn't think of what I was arguing with. I mean, she was right. There was no way to tell my story in any public form without sounding insane. It's a big decision. I get it. Here. She ruffled through her pocket for a card. It bore the same logo that her weapon had. The outline of a pine tree with a vague, sinister figure lurking behind it. Three human shapes clasping hands at the bottom. Surrounding the tree as though keeping the force behind it at bay. Beneath it read the word Rangers in bold, the year 1999 beneath it in smaller text. Below that, what I took to be the group's mantra. To protect those who venture into the great outdoors from the evil that occupies the great unknown. A number ran across the other side. If you make a decision, call. Otherwise, you should get going. I didn't know what else to say, so I nodded, thanking her as I turned and left the clearing. The drive back home was silent. My mind was played by more than I had arrived with for once leaving the park. I tried to ignore what just happened, to do what I had heard people claim to do with impossible experiences and just move on. Try to dismiss it as a faulty memory or a dream. But I couldn't. The car just sitting on my desk, growing more tempting by the day. The experience was horrifying, nightmare-inducing, and yet... I couldn't pretend the exhilaration I had felt wasn't greater than anything I had experienced in my day-to-day -day life. It's why I began writing this. I thought that if I share my story somewhere, I wouldn't be decreed as a lunatic, and it would scratch whatever itch is tempting me to make that call. I know that it was wrong, though. As I was writing this, I found myself more tempted than ever, and before long, I had done it. It had been her that had answered, recognizing me almost immediately. The details of what followed of her, another story and another day. But by the end of the call, my life had been changed. There are things that lurk in the forests of Illinois. Creatures that make themselves look like the trees and possessed an insatiable bloodlust. I suppose to take this as a warning not to do what I did. Stay off of the close trail no matter how suspicious it seems. It's probably like that for a very good reason. If you don't though... All this not necessarily lost. Try and find your nearest ranger. You might just get lucky. And that'll do it for this week's stories. If you've made it to the end here, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your continued support. 
I would also like to thank today's sponsor, Audible. Visit audible.com slash survive and listen now to Impact Winner Audible. And Green Chef. Go to greenchef.com slash mrcreep30 and use code mrcreep30 to get $130 off plus free shipping. I hope your guys' February is rounding out nicely. Remember that it's not too late to start making 2022 your best year yet. As always, I'm wishing you guys nothing but the best. Stay safe out there and remember, stay creepy.